Hello again, friends! And you are our friends, and welcome back to another edition of Jim Cornette's drive Through right here at the beginning of 2024. The second edition of 2024. I'm your host, the great Brian Last. We have a lot of things to talk about today. It's like a weekly competition. Who's going to go on Twitter and make a fool of themselves from AEW? Answering that question and so much more, the star of the drive through Mr. Jim Cornette. I don't know that it's that much of a competition, though. Tony seems to be running away with it, much like Jesse Owens in the 36 Olympics. He's way ahead of the rest of the field. But uh, again, we, we, we just want to... We just want to talk about some old time wrestling, some of the old school wrestling and and make a little fun of the TV shows cuz that's kind of what they're here for these days to be made fun of. But we it's like that that promo from back in the 70s when Jerry Lawler and Bill Dundee were selling out drawing big houses in Mid-South Coliseum every Monday night and the program went like 12, 13 weeks, and about 10 weeks in, Lawler did the promo on TV. He said, I know a lot of you people are saying, I'm sick and tired of seeing you beat Dundee's brains out every week, Lawler. Well, let me tell you, I'm sick and tired of beating his brains out every We are sick and tired of reporting on this tomfoolery, these shenanigans, these extemporaneous childish fits that these gr supposed grown adults go into and and with a special uh, focus on the one supposed grown adult that is still living his childhood with a hundred million dollars to do it and they can't get out of their own way from he is calling more attention to himself as being a a socially awkward person at best than anything he calls attention. We don't have to knock AEW. He calls attention to the negative things in AEW when he goes off on his fucking deals. Except that it's now fewer and fewer of the faithful can turn the blind eye to the fact that the em Emperor Khan as his bits are dangling, he's got no clothes on. He doesn't know how to handle it. Brian, what have I said since he named himself Chief Cook and Bottle Washer and Major Domo and Head Honcho and the, the writer and the producer and the director? And he's the Orson Welles of this whole thing. Then he bought another promotion. Then he creates tournaments. Well, maybe he had the tournament you know, already booked from when he was 14 in the back of the classroom. And not only that workload, which we predicted was going to catch up with him eventually, when he allegedly even has other responsibilities with his football operation that he's got going on, and then all of his favorite action figures start punching each other out and fight with each other, and he's got to deal with lawyers and sometimes banish lawyers and he's got to deal with feuding wrestlers in his locker room and then he's got to start dealing with bad press coming from all of this is this the final sign that tony bless him has not slept in five years you can look at the man you can see the the metamorphosis the transmogrification of what he did he looked like a normal little Toe-headed boy with some glasses on. Toe-headed? I don't know. That's, a, that's an expression. I don't know what it means from the old yeah, days. I never he, heard that before. He's a cute little toe-headed boy. I think he was either <laughs> he either had a cow lick or he was blonde. I'm not sure which. But he looked like a normal, klutzy young man, shaven, wearing a suit, hair had seen a comb been introduced to a brush and shampoo. And now he looks like fucking Rick Moranis with his finger stuck in a light socket. No, he went from Rick Moranis to Rick James. He went from <laughs> being all buttoned up with glasses, looked very neat, looked like someone who may own something, to someone who really wants to fit in with all the boys. Well, in, in, he looked more like Phil Spector in court uh, with the press scrum 
But but it, I th is he finally is he flipping? Is the question I'm asking you. You have this, the whole documentation of this latest outburst and feud with everybody. There was even a a hot tag to Uncle Dave, come in and make the save because everybody knows Tony. You know he's just there to sell because he's not going to make a comeback on anybody. The big boys had to come in and do that. Uncle Dave's been in these Twitter trenches before. He knows how to come in with the fire. It's hard to summarize or even understand a lot of this. You know, one of the people got it right, and we'll get to this. We'll talk about a bunch of these tweets. But this is Tony at his core. This is Tony, the message board wrestling fan, who thinks his opinions and thoughts are correct, will attack anyone who has a problem with him, doesn't truly have an understanding of how things work, but thinks he does. He's every message board troll, but with a billionaire dad. And not only does it come out in instances like this, but it's almost like they were waiting for it. It was almost like, you know, we know we could set him up to act a fool. <laughs> because he does. Because everyone in that fucking company on social media does. And we have to take a step back. Because over the weekend, Jim, January 7th, after the Jacksonville Jaguars were eliminated from contention in the playoffs, they were done. They weren't going to get to the playoffs. I understand. That was unexpected, wasn't it? Well, WWE on Fox, and I don't know exactly who controls that Twitter account. It's not the main WWE Twitter account, but it's WWE on Fox. So it's we don't know whether it's, it's, it's the WWE side or the Fox side, but one... One would assume there's some collaboration there. Well, they retweeted a Jaguars tweet from December 13th last year that said playoff tickets are on sale now. <laughs> and they retweeted that with a meme of Kurt Angle looking, you know, confused. I don't know what the, the look <laughs> is exactly. I'm not trying to insult him. I don't know what he's standing in front of a house looking blitzed. I don't know what this look is here. I don't, I don't know what this. I, I just played it again. He doesn't say anything either. But they were trolling him. Because when you are WWE on Fox and you're doing that about the Jaguars, you're not doing that because they're owned by any other owner except the Khan family. Right. And they, they, can, they can get under Tony's skin without actually even acknowledging his wrestling operation that he's got going on. Because, again, he's a message board fan. Not all of them are bad, I'm not saying that, but there are ones who think they know and they don't. There's plenty of them who are in the business on some of your favorite message boards under various other names, <clears throat> and you realize even they're fucking ignorant and don't know anything. But that's who Tony is. And it appeared that there was almost a social media attempt to get his attention with this. He didn't respond that I saw. Fast forward a few days, Raj Geary, who I believe is a wrestling reporter, posted an image of Jinder Mahal from Raw. Did you say Roger Kirby? I didn't say Roger Kirby. Roger Kirby, the Nature Boy? No, this is Nature Boy Raj Geary. Right, Nature Boy Geary, okay. It's an image of Jinder Mahal in the ring with Seth Rollins this past Monday, and it says, These guys do have history. Seth Rollins defeated Jinder Mahal in the tournament finals to become the first NXT champion. Hashtag WWE Raw. Well, that's, that's good of him to bring up that factoid from history that I'm sure will add interest to this big altercation they're fixing to have. And here's where we get into something we've seen over the last several years. We've seen it from Wendy's or various other accounts. <laughs> USA Network responded to Raj Geary. What was the cage match rating? <laughs> so now the network... That WWE is on and that SmackDown will be going on to next year, they respond to a wrestling reporter in what can only be seen as an attempt to make fun of Tony Khan because he's the one who cites Cage Match. Uh, 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 the, the bitch slap uh, trademark, just in case you can copyright. <laughs> <laughs> to guess from the, from the USA Network to the pow. And and for those of you folks, again, who live in the real world and have, I don't know, mental capabilities, 
Cage Match is a website where like 50 or 100 people, from what I'm told, rate the, the star ratings of these matches that they see all around the world. And generally, the fewer people see it, the better it is, according to them. And Tony has actually quoted them, referenced them, him them having his back as far as his booking is just, well, it's, it's, just, it's just great. So that's what uh, the folks over at USA Network are fucking backhanding Tony now. Oh, my God. And again, God. what Cage Match is, is an attempt to get some insights from fans who have certain wrestling sensibilities of what they like. A very specific right. view. Right. Again, it's not a big fan base. It's not the overwhelming fan base. It's a portion of the audience. So there is something to that. I wouldn't base my whole business around it. That seems dumb. Well, what what cage match is, like in the old days, when we would have a shitty house, we as, as heels, we would go out and say, well, if there's a riot, at least we got them outnumbered. And that's basically the segment of the audience that Cage Match is. So Tony Khan on Twitter quote tweeted USA Networks asking what was the Cage Match rating with a moral victory for USA is one more win than their world title challenger Jinder Mahal has in the past 364 days. Because it's been literally a full year <laughs> since he won a match. You really put AEW in our place, getting Jinder Mahal in a big match on your TV show. What in the... Do it more often. <laughs> and then, before we go further, a second tweet from Tony Khan. A double standard. Hook, 28 and one career record, <laughs> on a winning streak, calls out the champ. A logical challenge sparks online outrage. Jinder has literally lost every single match he's in for the last year. Immediately gets a title shot. Where is the rage? Hashtag the AEW rage. Dynamite. Tomorrow on TBS. Uh, the rage, Brian, the rage. Where's the rage? Where, like Larry Latham used to say, where's the heat? So he's attacking their booking, and because of well, what he's saying, he's attacking all, the talent, too. No, he's starting out like, it's. oh my God, this is real. And it, it, here's the thing, because he's... The statistics fellow, the person who like he writes in his notebooks a lot. He has a lot of energy, other other allusions to his behavior, etc. Fill in the blanks. He's got this all worked out in his head because his action figures, Hook has beaten eighteen of these other however many of these other people that we wouldn't be able to fucking pick out of a police lineup in in preparation for going for this title it's one of 15 and his belt stew that nobody gives shit but that makes sense but not belt stew i like that <laughs> well uh, there you go or belt burgoo um or you know let's take uh gender mayhall who he's been a wwe champion but apparently he fell out of favor with the previous regime maybe that's what now they're giving him a shot at something here and we'll talk about him when we talk about the raw program but he is produced in a couple of weeks and he's also a grown adult fucking guy in the big company that looks the part has the foreign menace fucking heel vibe and aura going for him or uh, again hook a kid with great potential that was over for a while. He didn't know what to do with it. He's been hidden, sidetracked, paired with, you know, zombies of the stratosphere, Dan Housen and fucking Pockets and the comedy groups and the flipper floppers. And right now, the, the way he's been presented, whether he's a good athlete or not, or whether he's got potential and both are true. People wouldn't care if he dropped his pants, took a shit on Broadway compared to what goes on between Jinder Mayhall and Seth Franklin Rollins. It's just ludicrous. He doesn't understand the business. It's his notebooks and his statistics and his fantasies about this indie wrestling being able to reach a fucking legitimate audience. No, I mean, my thing was, and I tweeted out, it's not a double standard, it's a standard. Because the difference is, 
apparently AEW fans, and we hadn't even, I think, heard any of that feedback, were complaining about Hook challenging for whatever title he's... What challenge? What title is he challenging for? I don't even know. We don't even know. Jinder Mahal in two weeks has become one of the most talked about guys on their TV show. (laughs) No one was complaining coming out of that Seth Rollins angle. No one was saying, why are they doing this? They were saying, wow, two weeks in a row, this guy's been interesting. Yeah. He almost made Rollins interesting. So it's not a double standard. No one's complaining. It's it, like you said, it's, it's standard because it's booking. And it, it's, it, my God, it's a work. It doesn't matter what the fucking guy's record is at this point. Yes, it's wonderful when you bring a guy in from scratch, you're supposed to do these things. Give him wins, build his credibility, have him win more often than lose, and have runs at various championships or whatever. But once you've got the guy and he's hanging around, he's been used in the past, let's use that history and give him another fucking shot. You don't need, if, if he looks like that and can talk like that, to give him a goddamn six month, you know, win streak before he challenges for the secondary world title in the company. Before we go forward to other tweets, he's attacking the booking, but he's, like I said before, he's really putting down the talent. If you're wrestling talent thinking about signing with AEW at any point, do you look at stuff like this and say that you're, do you think you're embarrassed by this? Like, what do you think? In terms of a wrestler's perspective of what he's doing. Well, I don't, I don't think he's putting down the talent, or I don't even think he means... He, he's not a guy who wants to put down talent. What he's doing is he's putting down the talent, the way that they're being presented, but, you know, he's throwing fucking stones at a goddamn glass house, or whatever the uh, old adage might be that applies here, because everybody he presents gets under not over he diminishes them he, he's the opposite of the you know six million dollar man program he, we can make you less than you were before and here they're do they're doing something again in two weeks but so far successfully where people aren't especially against the rock obviously but the guy had gotten some legitimate level of heat as we discussed uh on his own and it's it's working and he looks credible and he's got some background there so they're making another this is wrestling it's you are supposed to make as many stars as you can so they're taking another guy that they've been paying it's on their roster and they're doing something with him saving sink or swim and he's now more interesting than he was three weeks ago what does tony do he books these fucking kids to do their goddamn gymnastics in ever-increasing, confusingly convoluted Gordian knots of fucking nonsensical angles. Stop me before I sub-reference again. But again, in two weeks, WWE's done a better job with Jinder Mahal than Tony did with Hook in the last year. That's, yeah, so it's just, he's just ranting out now because the... One of the, you know, maybe one of the kids down the block that's a little more aggressive came and kicked some of his blocks, and now he's pissed about it. But he w- he will go on. He do go on. Well, Eric Bischoff jumped into the fray because I guess he needs some attention. He posted a clown face responding to Tony Khan, or quote-tweeting Tony Khan, who then posted a... By the way, if I ever learn how to tweet a clown face, and I do, shoot me. If you can't verbally explain what you believe that a motherfucker ought to modify his behavior to, uh, then just don't bother. Tony Khan responded to Eric Bischoff by posting an image of Joan Collins, and it says, (laughs) Get out of my sight, you miserable has-been. So then... Wait, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. Vince, this is 25 years ago, Vince... Eric Bischoff just said he'll fight you. Vince gets his phone out and gets on Twitter and tweets him a picture of Joan Collins saying, get out of my face, you miserable. What, I, I, can yeah. you <laughs> imagine this kind of behavior from, I mean, anybody from Tootsmont on down, for fuck's sake. Can you see, like Solomon tweeted here earlier today, 
He tweeted pictures of the NWA promoters meetings throughout the years and said, you think these people would have been fucking bashing each other on Twitter when they were busy trying to savagely put each other out, each other out of business while pretending to be friends. No, Vince uh, tweeted a picture of Joan Collins who would also have how much money he paid her to sign an NDA. Well, he probably paid for half of her plastic surgery. So then someone... I didn't know you knew about Vince and Joan Collins. Well, let's uh, go to this. Uh, am I missing a tweet? I may be missing a tweet here. It appears that Eric Bischoff uh, was looking for more attention on this night. Him and Tony had a lot of time on this night. Oh, boy. So then someone responded, it appears, and said, Tony forgets that he literally gave Abaddon a title shot after being off AEW TV for over a year. <laughs> Same exact situation as Jinder. To which Eric Bischoff quote tweeted and said, hey, Tony Khan, is this true or is it a bot? <laughs> so that's actually funny. <laughs> <laughs> okay, he redeemed himself somewhat. Well, Tony quote tweeted that and said, no, Eric Bischoff, not true at all. Abaddon returned to AEW, plus then they won a four-way match on TNT against other great wrestlers to earn a title shot. Which is wait, completely wait, you've lost, you lost me around the fucking close turn with that <laughs> sentence. I guess it's not a plus. I guess it's supposed to be end. No, Eric Bischoff, not true at all. Abaddon returned to AEW and then won a four-way match on TNT against other great wrestlers to earn a title shot, which is completely different than someone going a full year losing every match they're in, <laughs> getting a title shot without a single win. <laughs> he then replied to himself, <laughs> reading would be your friend, Eric. Which is a Dave Meltzer uh, term. Uh, Uncle David, but hold on a second. So he's <laughs> again, it's a fucking work, and nobody saw or gave a shit about the four way she won to begin with because it sucked. And you did. It's my God. And did I mention it's fucking work? Well, Eric Bischoff responded to Tony saying, "Reading would be your friend, Eric." Oh, kid, my reading comprehension skills are wizard like. By the way, that was one of Dave Meltzer's wicked comebacks whenever he'd get called out on his BS. Coincidence? Or are you really that deep? All right, is Eric drinking yeah, does again? He, is does, Eric he mean, <laughs> does he mean deep up Dave's ass or what in his cavernous rectum? Or, you know, they're, go they're, they're thinking about saving money by putting a fucking curse of Oak Island into Dave's ass next year. Less ground to cover. Well, Dave Meltzer decided to quote tweet that, and he wrote, Dude, sorry I prepped you for that last <laughs> Dude, word. wait! He's 60 fucking three! Isn't, isn't Dave like a year older than me? Well, if you've been using dude your whole life, you could he's still use dude. He's 60 fucking three. He, he begins a tweet to a person that he's about to fucking bless out, as Aunt Lola used to say, with dude. Dude, sorry I prepped you for that Landsberg interview when you made the claim about how you averaged 5,400 tickets sold the prior year and bragged about it. The guy didn't have Hogan, Flair, Savage, or Piper, and has double the ticket prices and equaled your number. One of us actually studies numbers. The other one calls names because he can't remember, nor has any research capability. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait. Do you, so what I am by the way that you read that again I was trying to take in Dave's tortured syntax Remember, he ought to be arrested for war crimes on syntax but so apparently when Eric Bischoff was interviewed at some point by old uh, was it Steve Landsberg or David Landsberg Michael Alan Landsberg, Landsberg Michael Land one of them Landsberg boys that he probably called or emailed or in some way asked Dave Meltzer, hey, how many fucking fans do we draw to these got average or whatever? And Meltzer told him, so now, well, goddamn, you don't, you had to come to me. Is that what that is? I don't know, but. I'm pretty sure Michael Landsberg hasn't interviewed anyone in like 20 years or something. Well, I right? know when this is... would be, yes, this would be when Bischoff was running WCW. So it's, it's from that, yes. Well, we will uh, continue on. Jinder Mahal retweeted Tony Khan and said, who the fuck is Hook? 
<laughs> Watch Monday Night Raw on USA Network Monday, 8 p.m. Taz retweeted that and wrote Hook. And then Dustin Rhodes wrote, <laughs> guys, just enjoy wrestling. We love to do it for you. Lighten up on the tribalism. Hashtag keep stepping. <laughs> <laughs> to which Paul Levesque tweeted, fuck you, Dustin Rhodes. <laughs> no, that didn't Come happen. That, that one didn't happen. <laughs> At this point, Jinder was the number one trending thing in the country. Anthony Bowens wrote, go hook. Hashtag lads. Dax Harwood. Lent his support to Hook and also started going after Bischoff. Well, it's not about supporting Hook. If we think he's a fine young man, he's been caught up in this display of his boss's immaturity and foolishness. Jeremy Lambert retweeted Tony Khan's tweet to Bischoff explaining why Abaddon was a challenger. <laughs> he wrote, Eric could have found this information on Cage Match. To which Tony <laughs> Khan replied, the irony! Hashtag <laughs> AEW Dynamite. <laughs> Hurricane Helms uh, tweeted out a picture of him drinking. It says, reading this on Twitter. <laughs> Wait a minute, it says what now? Well, it's just a picture of him drinking from a, from a cup, and it says, reading wrestling Twitter. Yeah. Oh, when you tweet, it said, tweeted a picture of him drinking, I I've, I've was picturing him with a fucking bottle turned about halfway up and... Again, a few other wrestlers chimed in. Here's an interesting one from Matt Cardona. Brian Myers and him lost 269 matches in a row before we won the tag titles at WrestleMania, and the place exploded. So again, I'm not saying everyone should have losing streaks, but the idea that people wouldn't <laughs> care just because someone has been losing with modern booking isn't necessarily... Well, but it, again, this is, so, this is the boss of the company. It's like if Vince was down there fucking having a goddamn spirited back and forth conversation with Howie, the mailroom guy, as they were debating about the way things should be done on the third floor. And when they put the fucking mail in the goddamn mailbox and the jello pudding, it's a, it's, it's can you, the childishness of this and that Tony is awkward and comes off as awkward and not, and more people are starting to realize it. And even, you know, some of his more ardent supporters are like, can anybody tell him to just stop the childishness and the lashing out? And the a few weeks ago, I said it was, you know, Patty McCormick and the bad seed. I'm beginning to think she had a few fucking IQ points on him at this at this particular juncture. Well, I'm going through all these tweets. It appears Eric Bischoff is uh, trying to drum this up a little bit more, get some attention on him. Someone named Sir Lariato <laughs> wrote, hire a PR person? Nah, fuck that. <laughs> it absolutely rules that the owner of the second largest wrestling promotion is an old school message board shit poster through <laughs> and through. And Tony liked that. So, I mean, this is part of the problem. <laughs> Tony wants this attention. He doesn't realize that the shit posters on message boards are the people the rest of us mock. They're not the cool people in the room. They're the exact opposite. Of well, besides, and it's, it's still a very small room when you're talking about the audience that a, an operation of his, the size that he has attempted and is set up and needs to, you know, keep operating needs to be. It, he needs the whole house, not just that one room of really devoted people so he can stand there and preach to the choir and have his friendly websites come and ask him questions for hours like he's, you know, goddamn bum Phillips or one of these goddamn big sports coaches. And it, 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 the whole fantasy revolves around people not confronting him or challenging him on shit because it makes him uncomfortable. It's not fun for him. He ducks back from it. But he can sit there and do that because somehow he can say, but Cage Match liked it, even if, you know, this, or because what well, your booking is horrible because you're, you're two nobodies that you matched for one of your 15 titles didn't have a fucking win streak first, like mine. It, it's just... This is, what I've, this is what I've said from start. 
It's 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 a, a a fan. This has happened throughout wrestling history, just not to this level of of, of financial expenditure. But from the territory days, the pioneer days, and even in the modern independent days, Tony reminds me. Do you know what old time? From the Territory Days promoter that Tony Khan reminds me of. From the Territories? Al Haft. Miriam Springfield. <laughs> Why is that? And do you do you remember Miriam? I worked for Miriam Springfield. What town was that? Tupelo, Mississippi. And uh, we, we won't go into it now. And later on in the program, if you like, we'll circle back to Miriam Springfield. And see, that's a little tease to get the people to keep listening. But back to you, back to the the tweets from all of these people well, who are yeah, peddling I mean, various rags, paper, and pens to the public. Again, here's part of the problem: wrestling Twitter is more interesting than wrestling. And another part of the problem is Tony's complaining about this. It's about personality. They got Jinder's personality over more in two weeks than you've done with anyone all year. You can book matches that you think could be great matches. It's American professional wrestling. It's about personality. And, and, and to be quite honest, look what he considers great matches. It's not even that he doesn't have an eye toward the personality or the, the psychology of how I don't even like to use the word storyline. That's not a wrestling term. That's a made up modern you know, a fan, a smart fan term, but the psychology behind it, the angle behind it, he not only doesn't understand that, but look at what he thinks is great matches. He legitimately believes that Riho is having great matches, partially because he doesn't want to hurt her feelings and partially because I believe he really thinks that. And so few other people do. Well, Jim, the wrestler Idris Enough Hey, oh, a, seriously, what? He's in NXT, right? Oh, well, with a name like that, it would almost have to be there. He retweeted Tony's tweet about double standards and wrote STFU, which translates to shut the fuck <laughs> up. <laughs> so now the NXT wrestlers are taking shots at Tony. <sighs> Let's give this guy credit for once he had a good line. Disco Inferno tweeted out, if he doesn't win Booker of the Year, things might get uglier. <laughs> see that is funny that is funny uh, I'll, I'll give you that one Glenn there you go baby Jose the assistant retweeted Tony Khan's Joan Collins image and said savage AEW Tony Khan is the best Tony Khan don't oh cross my. the boss <sighs> stack the AEW Dynamite episode tomorrow live from Daly's place does it qualify you to be described as savage when you retweet a picture of an 80s fading B-movie star in a network TV show and uh, unfortunately she's long since dead? Does that qualify you as being a savage? Like if, if he I pulled out some fucking nucks and dusted his goddamn jaw off? That's kind of savage. It's kind of savage for the record. I don't know about the meme. For the record, Joan Collins is alive. She's 90 years old. No. She was born 1933. Holy shit. Well, with the life she's led, I can't believe she's still alive. And maybe she'll be at uh, Wembley for the big <laughs> all-in spectacular. Wouldn't that be something? If Tony could bring in Joan Collins, maybe he can get uh, some of the other cast of Dynasty to come back. That show had uh, ratings. They had ratings. We're gonna we're gonna be all in Joan Collins at Wembley Stadium. I'd pay to see that. Many men did. <laughs> Many men did. But uh, Jim, this is the. Uh, I mean, it's more wrestlers trying to dive in and either kiss ass or get into the back and forth. Who knows what the motivation for everyone is here? But it's really about Tony Khan. Whether they trolled him knowing he was going to react, or whether. Social media accounts tied to WWE, partners of theirs that they don't even control the social media accounts of, they're going after the boss of AEW. Yes. And he's responding and playing into their hands in a lot of ways. He probably thinks he's doing a good job on social media with this stuff. He also thinks every episode's great, every match is great, and his media scrums are not problematic at all. We also know that Tony is not honest about any of the inner workings in AEW with anyone who asks him any questions about it. 
Well, and, and I'll hear something else before you slide on by it, baby. Let's back up. Let's moonwalk back to it. The fact that these unrelated entities, and yes, we've seen that various social media people who have these unrelated to wrestling, have charge of the unrelated to wrestling accounts, whether it be Wendy's, whether it be USA Network, whatever the case, they have chimed in on occasions because the social media people are probably, if not wrestling fans per se, certainly cognizant of what's going on in wrestling because it's so much social media, right? That's a fair statement to make. It's not just wrestling. I think it's across the board, but yeah. Yeah. So when they chime it, but they also now, it's becoming a thing where, yeah, I can just fucking bitch slap this guy and, and, I don't even care if he responds because it's going to be entertaining and so weak. And they're taking shots because they can. They feel emboldened to. Impunity has set in on making fun of the way Tony Khan has been acting, talking, tweeting, whatever the case. And that's kind of... Do you ever remember a, a point where it was just... Besides if you were billionaire Ted that it was okay in the wrestling business or anywhere around it to just openly make fun of Vince McMahon? I mean, Bischoff did it. The fans could, but I'm talking about anybody but, you know, the the WCW empire. Even, Even Crockett and Dusty weren't making fun of Vince. They weren't talking about Vince. Vince was a boss, for good or for bad, whatever you want to say about him, and of course his perverted, weird antics and <laughs> all these weird, perverted payoffs. All and right, else. but down, boy. Uh, that's what they said to him, and he didn't Hell. listen. He said, no, I don't listen to anyone. Should have kept that water hose where you could reach it. Fuck Joan Collins. But what were we saying about the pervert? I forgot. Um, no, oh, what he I was, was, a was a boss. He was a boss. It wasn't just about social media. It was about the way the people who worked there treated him, talked about him, respected him or if they didn't respect him, didn't talk about him in a way that was publicly embarrassing. AEW is none of that. They have none of that. And again, I always say nothing's getting better. Like there's nothing that would give you the confidence to think now's the time for me to go out there and whip out my cock. (laughs) No, put that thing away. (laughs) He took it out. But you know, the problem is it's not going to stop. Tony thinks this is good marketing Work, I guess. Good publicity. Any publicity is do you, good publicity. Do you think he he thinks about it that way first, or does he just want to just you know burn the person who has offended him on the spot? Is he is he kind of like in some way of a, a, a Trump esque Twitter person who's just his head's on fire when these people are saying these bad things about him? I think it's like the special announcements. The first time he did it, it popped a number. The second time it did, it popped a number, not as big, but still a little bit of a bump. Eventually that went away because he thought it was a tool that he could use and then he used it nonstop. I don't know. I don't think Tony's been ever been that far away from a little bump. <laughs> did you just knock us off the air? What happened? I, I knocked us off the air laughing at what you just said, but yeah. there it is. But I think social media is the same way. I'm going to guess at some point in the four-year history of Dynamite, some of his social media stuff, which wasn't him just warring with people, caused what he thought was the numbers to go up. And I think it's a tool that the day before a taping or a live show, he may want to use. I don't think that's outrageous. Can anybody help him with it? Give him some suggestions, maybe what to do or not to do or say or... Coaching, guidance, mentorship. There are lots of people that could help him, but when you don't think there's a problem, when you think everything you touch turns to gold, when you think everything you're doing is right, when you can justify all your shit in your head, that's the problem. And that's Tony. And do we hear the wind in the background? What the hell is happening here? Oh, you're having a windstorm. A tropical windstorm. You're having a windstorm. A tropical windstorm. And that's why you do the can-can. I think that uh, you, your, your hypersensitive hearing is bugging me because mine's going where you can hear fucking goddamn satellites circling the earth, whereas I can't hear it thunder in the same room. 
We both got defective hearing, and, and it's gone in separate ways. Well, I don't know what else we could really say. Like I said, this was the talk of wrestling overnight, as we are taping here today. And, you know, it's... Uh, it's He's be- trying to be Trendy McTrenderson. I thought we had that all sewed up. That one tweet was right, though. You know, when he doesn't win Booker of the Year, or when WWE books Wembley Stadium, <laughs> or when any of these things happen, the way he's dealing with any of the issues... What about when things get really bad and things get worse? And they're going to get worse. They're going to get worse. I know they just hired an executive, a COO. Who's the CEO? That's the problem. The CEO is the head of the GM, the CEO, the head of creative, the head of this, the head of that. He's the one that causes the entire company to take on his personality. But who did they get to be the coup? Hold on, let me, uh, you may know this guy. AEW. Now, don't blame me in any way, shape, or form. I wasn't even there. AEW, it was first reported, it looks like, by Fightful. AEW has hired Kosha Irby to be the COO. Wait a minute, is he Japanese? I don't know who Kosha Irby is, but Irby... Oh, I thought you said Kota Ibushi. No, Kosha Irby who was previously the regional director of live events for WWE from 2011 to 2018. He will now be the COO. He was also the chief marketing officer for Clemson University's athletic department and the president of the Memphis Express AAF football team. Wait a minute. What? Hold on. I have a couple questions. And he's also the chief marketing officer for the professional bull riders, LLC. (laughs) I thought you were going to say professional bullshitters. No, he's just joining their ranks right now. He's just, he just started in that line. But what is an AAF football in Memphis? What is AAF? Do you have any knowledge of this? Uh, I'm looking it up right now. I've just not heard of that. It is the Alliance of American Football. It was a professional football minor league. And something bad happened. This was the one that Charlie Ebersol started. Remember when they did the XFL? Uh, I guess it was 30 for 30. And at the end, Vince started his league and then Ebersol's oh. kid started his. I guess this is the one that Charlie Ebersol had started. What ha- what who finished it or is it still going? Well, I'm going to go right here to this section. that says bankruptcy li- liquidation. Whoa, I'm going to guess this may be the end. Uh, the five. Operating entities filed for joint Chapter 7 bankruptcy. Woo, I didn't even know they had a Chapter 7. The uniforms and equipment were stored in a lot in San Antonio, Texas, and eventually auctioned off in 2019. God damn. Former AFL Commissioner Jerry Kurz made the winning bid at $455,000, beating out bids from, among others, the revived XFL. Well, anyway, so, but back to... Back to uh, Kirby. Ishmael. Irby. Um, no, not Kirby. Kirby. Irby. Kosher Irby. Kirby. Kirby. Kosher Irby. He's kosher. He's not kosher. He's kosha. Yeah. Kosha. Jewish fella? No, K O S H. How are you spelling these words? Wait a minute. Back up. Let me get a pin here. <laughs> what is his? <laughs> we're, we're talking seriously. What is his first name? Again, I'm asking you. We're trying to be serious. We're talking about the new COO, the chief operating officer of AEW, Kosher Irby. K O S H A I R B Y. I R B Y or N R B Q? Well, or is is he a, a cousin of the Arby's family? I don't know. Anyway, the point is, but he, COO, you said he worked as a regional director for the day, the wrestling experience he's got. We've made fun of his other occupation, but the wrestling experience is he's worked for the WWE as a regional director is what you said, of the live events. I believe it was regional director live events from 2011 to 2018. What was he, the regional director or a regional director? Because they they have a lot more titles and a lot more different layers than they did when I was there 30 years ago, and Ed Cohen has had his market reps and, you know, gave them everything and split it up, blah, 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 and Bob Collins did WrestleMania. It was It was easy. I'm sure they got a bunch of fine, motivated young business people now, but was he one of a group of the old-time market reps, or was he a guy in charge of 
something on a company-wide basis? That would be the question I would have had. And otherwise, I've never heard of this fucking guy before. And again, COO... Is that's, Kosha sort, short for something? No, it doesn't appear so. It appears that's his name. But again, COO is number two. CEO is number one. COO is number two at almost any serious corporation. Yeah, so how... He was a regional live event guy, and suddenly he's number two in command of the entire national televised wrestling company. I I would like to have more information. Now, chief operating officer makes me think that a lot of the things that maybe there are some changes right now would be under him. Things that wouldn't involve booking because Tony's not letting go of that. Things like merchandising, live events, all these things that there have been nothing but problems with. And they just, coincidentally enough, at the end of the year, all these people decided to go. Wonder if this guy's got a legal degree also. Maybe. To kind of no. suss out the legal department. Come on, I'm sure the Jaguars have done great since they got some uh, more legal help there a few months ago for whatever reason that was. But, Jim, to tie this all together, WWE, or not WWE, AEW, a new COO, does a COO make a difference? Well, if if it's what you just said, yeah, I mean... <laughs> I'm not saying this one will or won't because I have uh, this first time I've heard of him breathing on this planet, right? Not an extensive background at the top of a wrestling company or even a a national televised anything company to be a number two or a COO as you described it. But if it's got to be a step up that he has any experience compared to some of the people that he may potentially be replacing. As you mentioned, find somebody that does merchandise at our level, which is not the level of the NFL, but not the level of the goddamn, you know, outlaw mudshow.com. Or find uh, you know, people who we can hire in these various positions that we have you know, gone to our our own little incestuous well when this company was a, a just a, as Mama Cornette used to say, a gleam in your father's eye. But now that it's actually running these fucking NBA arenas and there's nobody in it, we do need local promoters out there that know how to hustle. And, you know, if, if any of those things where they're showing weakness, imagine how much ground that takes in. This guy probably be better than the ones he's replacing. The question is, is he somebody's fucking friend? You have to wonder in this company, is, is, it, is he related or friends or, you know, whatever or else was, is he a budding a business genius that they have recognized and plucked out of the fucking field to be theirs? See, the sad thing is, if he is a genius and he's coming along now, he's too late. If they had had that person <laughs> in that position four years ago, it would be a different game, maybe. But wait, but maybe he can take and take the body while it's on the operating table on the life support. He can take the brain out. He can massage it a little bit, put it back in. Let's say they could fix a lot of the problems, the internal, the operating problems. I mean, he's a chief operating officer, everything from merch to what merch is there, just everything. If you could do all that and the booking continues to fall apart and viewers continue to find other things to do, both on cable and on YouTube, then you have a problem. Now you have the serious yeah. team. Now everything's working out, but you don't have the, the content, the star power. I mean, we talk a lot about their star power recently on their show, the lack of it. If you get everything else together, but you don't have that, it's too little too late. Well, but then here you're overlooking one thing, though. If you don't technically have to make money and you got that good team, then they can continue to do a, a hell of a job of selling that lackluster product as long as Tony and his dad want to keep doing that. So this guy could be there for 10 fucking years. Well, we wish you good luck, Kasha, and... Uh, or, um... What's his name? No, it's it's uh, Abe King Kong Cashy. Cashy. Abe King Kong Cashy. That man saved a lot of stuff, which is always popping up on eBay. But Jim, final words about Tony Khan and all this. Um, I'd like to say I knew Tony Khan well. No, um, those are the final words. Uh, Tony needs... <sighs> somebody around him needs to say, Tony, you need to take a vacation for a couple weeks. You need to 
goddamn start on decaf or maybe get a full physical examination, sleep for eight hours, do something, calm the fuck down, and reevaluate your priorities of what's going on, and don't rely on cage match instead of the the cold hard facts of the ratings of the programs and don't rely on jousting with people on Twitter when you've got a serious issue of absolutely no healthy fucking main event level individual star on your roster that people aren't sick to fucking death of. Start with that. Well, we'll see how all that works out, but you said, uh, you know, one of the things Tony Khan can do is get a good night's sleep. We know someone who may be able to help him with a good night's sleep. Well, you know, that's true. And actually, our friends at Helix, by the way, Helix Sleep Mattresses, we've been talking about them for ages because you and I both and our family members and, and close personal friends and our pets, we all lay our weary bones out at night when, when we're ready to stretch out or fold up or flop down or whatever description best fits the individual and have a good night's sleep we're all on the helix sleep mattresses but you know i'm wondering do they have they they used to remember in the hotels brian are you old enough remember when you'd stay at a like a holiday inn or some kind of hotel on the roadside in the 60s the bed for for a quarter you could put a quarter in and it would vibrate for about 15 minutes the vibrating bed that was so those weary travelers driving could lay down and get like the vibrating massage and boy that was a treat especially when me and mama Cornette would out go out to visit my grandmother out in hopkinsville we would stay at the place they had the daggum quarter thing boom turn it vibrate for 15 minutes is so much fun it sounded like a goddamn lawnmower it was very loud but it was vibrating, and that was entertainment to a fucking child in those days. Except for then the final time I got the the room with the vibrating bed, and I put the quarter in, and I turned the thing, and I laid back, and as it started vibrating, apparently it had been under heavy usage at that particular location, and the fucking thing fell right out from under the goddamn bed and landed on the floor and was going, ah! like that and i couldn't figure i can't turn there's no way to turn the goddamn thing off now i'm trying to turn the oh god damn it and i'm screaming mama 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 because i'm like fucking nine or whatever and she can't i think she somehow found a way to pull the plug well you don't have to do that with helix sleep mattresses but what i was gonna wonder is instead of a vibrating mattress brian do you think they have a mattress that will keep people from vibrating like Tony Khan, because you can tell he's bouncing off the walls. He's shaking like a dog shitting peach seeds. When he lays down, there needs to be some kind of, I don't know, sealant foam that encompasses him, that holds him in place for the night so that he doesn't rattle and rotate and vibrate the whole goddamn house apart. I wonder if they have one of those at Helix. Well, you know, they have the sleep survey that you do to get the right mattress and i would have to think tony khan based on the way he behaves his condition i don't think he needs a firm mattress i think it needs to be one that you can kind of sink into almost one that you could fold up on both sides of him like a little tony burrito and maybe staple it and what? keep him in one place no, for a while i did not say any of that but maybe well you know if if you get us one soft enough it's like you don't have to roll the body up in a carpet like so often happens when you're out and about I, you I can just fold the, the mattress up around the I body. I don't know anything about that kind of stuff. I, I ain't got nobody. But I'll tell you what, Helix does have the the mattress for the, the big and tall <laughs> folks. They have the plus size mattress for the big and tall is what it says. And that gives you plenty of room to do whatever you want because you don't have to. You can get this without being either unnaturally large or, you know, offensively tall or big or whatever you know like the the, the I'm, I'm sure the thousand pound sisters on that tv program they're probably on a helix because look at the state of them or what? if you're if you're just a, a giant if you're seven and a half feet tall but you only weigh say 190 pounds so your feet are size 22 but it looks like you're standing in canoes you can get one of these and if you have to you can sleep corner to corner we'll work it out just what? 
tape measure yourself and fill the application out. I don't know how much of that would apply here, but again, ladies and gentlemen, you want a good night's sleep, a comfortable mattress, the right mattress for you. Yeah, even if you're offensively large and grotesque. Or, they've got they're they're gonna service you no matter how much society shuns you. Well, again, if let's, you're if you're a, a grossly obese and 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 well, just your skin looks like goddamn baggy fucking skin on a goddamn old goat, you'll oh, still find what? people that will that will love you and deal with you here. They won't shun you or turn you away because of your appearance. I don't want to talk about goat love or whatever it is that you're trying to talk about here, but we're talking about comfortable beds and comfortable mattresses. And of yes. course, nobody, as you said earlier, do you think Tony should record a version of just the gigolo? Oh, you know, as a matter of fact, come on, bobbity bop, skitty bop. I think that would be perfect for him. He could have the little uh, top hat on like Michigan J frog and the, and the cane. But I'm just a gigolo, he, and everywhere I go, I fear for my life. <laughs> well, yes, because they got gigolos that, that that operate on the Helix Sleep mattress too, you know. Because it's it's highly popular in that line of work because of it, its uh, exuberance and also its resilience to stand up under punishment. Because every Helix Elite mattress comes with a 15-year manufacturer's warranty, and all of them come with a hundred night free trial and as matter of the other ones come with a little i think there's a 10-year warrant hey if you're if you're 60 65 years old just go ahead and buy this and say fuck it you won't need another one because well, let's you'll not be, look at it that you'll, way. you'll be let's... you'll be fucking you'll be in the ground you'll be pushing up daisies you'll I, be again fertilizer let's, let's by the not time you need a new mattress so you can not have to worry about that do you want to be laying on your deathbed at the old folks home brian last Thinking, oh god damn it, oh god, I'm gonna, I'm gonna live three months, but god damn it, my mattress is gonna wear out in six weeks. I should have done something twelve years ago. I don't plan on leaving last manor if I'm in that state. I'm not going to an old folks' home. Well, you don't want to be. Whatever you're laying on, are you by the hey, by the time that because you're a young man, by the time that you reach that point, you could have blown all the money and you could be sleeping on a fucking stack That's of right. rocks. And by the time I'm that age, they may discover something that causes life to go on forever, so it may not be your last Helix Sleep mattress. There's always more, and they're always comfortable, and they're always well, right for you, and there's always no. a great way to sleep on them. Helix Sleep! See, I got a loophole in that, because if you're going to go on forever, you want the best quality mattress, so get one of these right now. Because if it's guaranteed yeah. for 15 years, they probably think the thing's going to last for 20. So you're, you're just, you're just, you're doing the right thing financially. If you go right now. If you're young, buy three. That's 45 years covered. Well, there you go. Just get three of them, because you're going to get 20% off. So there you go. Get three of them, and you'll get 60% off. Helix right now is offering 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. If you go to Helix, H-E-L-I-X, sleep.com slash J-C-E and use the code HelixPartner20, you're going to get 20% off and two free pillows. So if you are a person and they got, the, let's say the, the elite's got the 15-year warranty, the other's got the 10-year warranty. Let's say you go for an elite. And you're a person who is 30 years old and you expect to live to be 75 years old. Right now, you get three mattresses. You'll get six free pillows and 20. So you get 60% off, 20% off times three, right? Is that the way that that would work? Brian, there's got to be a loophole in that somehow. There certainly does. Uh, there's a double standard. It's a double standard. Oh, it's a double standard instead of a, a fucking reverse okie doke. Well, you'll still get you'll get twenty percent off three mattresses, so it'll be like you got sixty percent off one mattress, and that means you got a thirty-three and a third percent chance of loving each of those mattresses. So right now, helixsleep.com slash jce use the code helixpartner twenty and buy three mattresses. Actually, you could buy six because. If you got a friend the same age, they're going to be in the same fucking boat. So just go ahead and get six. Give three to them. Keep three for yourself. You'll never have to buy another mattress again. And you'll have again six. You'll have you'll have enough pillows for a New Orleans whorehouse. If you buy five beds, you get a free Jim Cornette autograph. All right, all right. But you have but to they, prove it. You have to prove it. You have to prove it. 
And I'll and, and and then you have to come and and take it from an envelope hanging on my fence. <laughs> why? Why? Why do we have to make it so problematic for everyone to get? Well, the money? I'm not going to run over to the post office just for that. All right, HelixSleep.com. Well, yeah. What's the promo code? JCE and well, it's slash JCE, and the promo code is Helix Partner Twenty. That's what it is. And that's what it is. And a lot of people don't think it'd be like it is, but it do. We are in the future in a very lazy way, Jim. Here today. That was actually kind of musical. Oh. Well, Sounded like one of the fucking villains was about to pop up on Lost in Space. Well, I plan to start doing entrance music for Japanese wrestlers, and then once my unique sounds get over there, everyone here will accept them. They will, oh, they'll, but now promise me that you won't have the tuba player and the oboe player doing an instrumental and fighting over it by allowing each one to slap the other one with their various instrument. I can promise you I won't be there for it. <laughs> I don't know what the promoters will do once uh, they get the license. Once your for my shit music. gets over and everybody misunderstands it too, you don't know what they'll do from there. Oh my god, who's coming through the apron? <laughs> it's the warrior! Should they start adding the dramatic 40s radio serial sound effects to wrestling now since it's the rest of it is a parody? Should we have should Spike Jones and the City Slickers be doing the uh, entrance music now? Well, I guess if you were going to try that out, you would... For all you vintage radio fans out there. You would start with a Tony Storm, I think, to try out something from that era and see if it gets over, and then other people can go as well, far no, as they want no, with it, flashy Tony show Storm's, bands. She, hers would have to be vintage, too, so she'd have to go back into the fucking, like, 1890s and do some kind of dance hall routine, like... Fucking uh, Yukon Annie or something. Klondike Kate. I wish Jim Hurd was there with his ideas to get, like, Turner branding onto the shows. Like, like Tony Storm could feud with Thelma Todd. I actually, I stole those ideas that I just came up with from stuff that Jim Hurd wanted to do. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, uh, we'll get to uh, whatever happened to Spartacus and everything else later on in the show. But Jim. Long John Silver. Uh, we left everything before, uh, with Helix Sleep, of course, but before that, talking about AEW's new COO, uh, Kasha Vonnegut. I forget what his name was now, but... We He's also, from Kenosha, Kenosha, Wisconsin. We also have some other news, and it ties into some things we've recently talked about. This is from Variety by Joe Otterson. WWE hires ESPN alum Lee Fitting as head of media and production following Kevin Dunn's exit. So. They've made a hire, an outside hire from ESPN. Before we say anything else, what do you think of that? Well, but now, was that was not, is, is he hired after Kevin Dunn's departure? Is he hired to take Kevin Dunn's position? That was not Kevin Dunn's position. Can we clarify? If I'm confused, some of the listeners may be as well. Well, I'll read the article, but of course, Kevin Dunn also had positions beyond his production uh, capabilities. He oh, was yeah, his... he could get in all kind of positions when Vince was around, down well, on his right. knees, groveling on his ass. That's right. And most, uh, I don't know how many TV producers get those kind of uh, perks that, like he got, but here's the article. WWE has hired Lee Fitting as the company's new head of media and production. Variety has learned. At least he's got a name you can pronounce and have heard other people with in the past. This hiring comes just after the departure of Kevin Dunn, the longtime WWE head of production. Dunn had been with WWE for over four decades before his exit was announced in late December. He was then thrown out a window. <laughs> Fitting joins WWE after a 25-year run at ESPN. Wow. During his time with the sports broadcasting powerhouse, he oversaw production on telecasts like Monday Night Football, College Game Day, the college football playoff, and several others. He departed ESPN in August 2023. We have a fluff quote from Nick Khan. This is the latest change. This is not from Nick Khan. I'm going past the fluff quote. This is the latest change at WWE in the past year. WWE was officially sold to Endeavor in September 2023, with Endeavor merging WWE and the UFC into a new entity known as TKO Group Holdings. Vince McMahon, 
former CEO of WWE, has assumed the role of executive chairman of TKO Group. Paul Triple H Levesque is WWE's chief content officer and head of creative. And then it talks about how Raw currently has their rights being negotiated for. Again, what do you think? An outside hire, 25 years of experience at ESPN, including Monday Night Football, I mean, major programs, major sporting events, weekly sporting shows. Well, that's that's what I was going to say is that <laughs> I'm not a sports fan, but I've heard of all that shit. And he was there for 25 years with ESPN, who is the, you know, a premier sports broadcaster, whatever their tagline is. With all due respect to the other guy and what he may be doing or not doing that they hired, you know, in AEW to be the coup, the COO. They need a he, coup. They need a coup yeah, over they, there. They need, a, they need a palace coup real bad. <laughs> but, I mean, he had, you know, I was asking, like, is that a big, what is this football league that he worked with? And I can't remember it now what it was. And, you the know, he AAF. was someplace, yeah, he was, well, the off old football league. Um, and he was somewhere else for four years or whatever. This guy sounds with the WWE like a pretty accomplished individual in, in sports broadcasting. Could that be another sign that they're going to maybe make it a little more like that type of thing for the modern era instead of. Shakespeare with turnbuckles. For the most part, a lot of the people who start working in wrestling production, or at least did over the last 40 years, stayed in it. You know, there are names that are still there until they decided to go. Keith Mitchell. Dan Bynum is still active, I believe. Yeah. You know, various people like that. They started doing it, and they're still doing it. What about something like this? I mean, what's the learning curve like for taking someone who seemingly has no professional wrestling television experience and bringing them not only into pro wrestling, but the WWE production world. Well, with the, the guys from the territory days who you mentioned that, you know, the name, some are, are still with us and they got in it and stayed in it for a long time. You had to have a better working knowledge of what wrestling was and what the boys did and know the individuals and kind of follow along with the program because so much of it was on the fly and so much of it wasn't scripted out or written down or even relayed sometimes to the production people. And you had to kind of have a feel for the shit. To be, that's why there were so many missed camera shots. There was no such thing as a producer of a match back then, right? And so, the, you know, the fucking production crew is literally watching this chaos unfold and, and it's, you know, they might know who's going to win or the approximate finish, but it, it, it's now much more controlled, as we know, much more pre-planned, much more, everybody's more in on exactly what's going to take place. They walk through shit, for Christ's sake. So what you need now at the level of, of the WWE or allegedly AEW, is a television production whiz who knows how to get the the proper people and knows how to find the director that can handle a 7 or 8 or 10 or 12 camera live shoot or more for WrestleMania, and how to have a, a overall look because you've got the budget. You're competing with network sports programs how to have the overall look of the program for whatever reason people have attributed to Kevin Dunn. He wasn't doing it when I was there, but I'm not absolving him, but the goddamn zoomy shit, right? That's kind of, that's a television production choice in the overall flavor of the way things being presented. And I think they probably did it to cover up that the guy's work looked like shit. Right, but maybe we can tighten that shit up too while we're at it, at the risk of sounding like Bill Watts. But, you know, Vince and Kevin Dunn, he loved the whole arena lit up, which is why that's become a standard thing because he wanted to see the big crowd rather than the, the darkening when the match begins and the more dramatic, you know, et cetera, look for that. Maybe there's a change there. Maybe, you know, who knows what the fuck, but a, a head of production 
at a television production that large or a television production company that large doing programs like that has to know everything there is to know about TV, how to shoot these buildings, how to get the most out of it. You've heard people say that even when AEW had a crowd of some size, they'd shoot it and kind of didn't look that way, but WWE can make everything look like they're in goddamn the Silver Dome. It's lenses, it's fucking equipment that's used, it's angles, it's getting the proper people to plan these things and execute it. And the massive roster of producers and agents and executives and muckety-mucks are going to be able to translate the what's going to happen in the wrestling to the, if they do their jobs to the production people who are going to shoot it like it's goddamn, you know, remake of Ben-Hur. At that level, that's what goes on. So, <clears throat> yes, in the old days, you needed to know some about wrestling, but now they're going to tell you everything about wrestling. You need to be an artist at the network level when it comes to television production. Well, we shall see what happens. Do they continue what they've always been doing? Do new ideas and new looks get introduced into the program? It'll be very Give us announcers in the ring instead of these motherfuckers just emoting at each other. Give us somebody in control of the program. Do the UFC fighters just come out and have unattended arguments? I would love to see the announcers produce so they could be natural. And not yeah, sound that fake. Part of it, yes. Yeah, not sound like they're having fake conversations about things they don't truly believe and yelling at us in a fake manner. Because that's never effective on any program. But wrestling seems to insist on it. We shall see what happens, but on that topic, Jim, I guess one of the productions under Lee Fitting's agenda right now, WWE Raw, and this past week WWE Raw took place from a city whose name I forget, <laughs> but it was an interesting show and they started out pretty yeah, yeah, hot. Wait a minute, yeah, Portland, Oregon. Portland, Oregon. Oregon, they were in Piper country. Paul Revere in the Raiders country. Well, that that too. Actually, no, wasn't that Massachusetts? No, you see, that's... Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm talking about the original. One. You're talking about the original outfit, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, yes, Raw on January 8th was from Portland, Oregon. And they're actually not only making Drew McIntyre interesting to me somehow, but they did an opening interview segment that within 15 minutes, I think it was under 15 minutes, three times as much as normal was said, and there was a fucking point to it, and it got got you interested in what might happen next. Imagine that. So already it's a, it's a new day, it's a new way, it's a new time, and they're talking good. But you're singing like shit. As hey! You, as usual. I haven't seen any goddamn praise on your singing from the Lee Strasberg Academy or whoever it is up there in New York that teaches that kind of thing. Lee Strasberg, he's teaching singing now. Well, it, 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 from it, the grave, it, by it, the way. He could do everything else. From the well, grave, he's teaching singing. He went to a whole new career. He went from acting to singing. Well, and, uh, <laughs> every time you hear, ooh, that's Lee Strasberg. Well, let's talk about this segment and who. Uh, McIntyre had a problem with. Uh, he McIntyre came out and started cutting a promo and basically he cost himself the match. He didn't win the title last week. Maybe I've been holding myself back. Maybe I need to step away and get my shit straight. And he's milking it. But no, then I realized I didn't lose. Priest cashed in like an idiot. Remember, this is, we didn't watch last week because it was New Year's. What the fuck? But Priest cashed in and cost him the match and not only didn't win the title for himself, but he cost him the title. He screwed me. And now I'm standing back and I see Cody coming in, getting all this political pull and Punk coming back and getting welcomed with open arms. Maybe I ought to leave for nine years and come back and get a hero's reception. And you'll never guess, Brian, what happened then. I saw the show. I don't have to guess. Oh, that's true. I and I'm afraid that. what's coming yeah. next. Like Mussolini, he's extra spicy. <laughs> because out came CM Punk, and he gets the chance, and etc. And that's what he said. We're in Piper country. 
He told Drew he should have worn the kilt. They would have appreciated him. And he came out so that whatever Drew had to say, he could say to his face. And this worked. Because Punk got up on the turnbuckle and stretched out like a wise ass and go ahead, big mouth, you know, kind of thing. And McIntyre, congratulations, over a month and you're still here and you haven't melted down or self-destructed, but I know the real you. And he listed his grievances from when McIntyre was there before as a kid in need of a leader. And now he tells Punk, I'm your leader now, kid. And then he lets Punk vent his spleen or out of whatever internal organ. And Punk, whereas Drew is a little more heelish with his promo, because that's the direction he's been going, Punk was a little more reasonable and level-headed guy. I never called myself a leader. I just was one. And he put over what McIntyre had done. And then he said, I don't know what you're upset about because I'm kind of following you. Because I, just like you followed me, I left to find myself or whatever, and then you left. Well, you came back, and now I'm following you. But then the fucking D, and this is the, beauty of punk is that you can take him any way you want to take him he says i'm not a demon i'm satan himself i'm a nice guy it's time not to be i'm not here to be a nice guy or make friends i'm here to win the royal rumble and main event wrestlemania and then you would have thought that would have been no drew fires back up and he tells punk off and it was halfway fucking good old drew's got a little fucking base in him now and this time he's going to win the royal rumble and main event wrestlemania with fans because remember he was in the uh the empty arena mania and it's going to be all for him and then punk said well before i'm going to lead by example i'm going to leave before i knock your teeth down your throat but only one person can stop me and it's me and i got out of my way a long time ago and he mentions Drew and Seth and Cody. Nobody can stop me from winning the Rumble. But since I'm a nice guy, I'll throw you out last. And boom, and they're under 15 minutes. And that was a lot of shit. It was all good. You know what's going to happen now? You ever see the movie Commando? Who was in it? Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's his best movie. Oh, did he go Commando? I don't know what you have in mind by Commando, but Arnold Schwarzenegger has an issue with a group of paramilitaries who have kidnapped his daughter, and he threatens the one guy. He goes, you're funny. I'm going to kill you last. And then he killed him first. And, he, and the guy he said to goes, you said you killed me last. He goes, I lied. And he kills him. Punk just said, I'll eliminate you last. Drew's going to be the first person eliminated by Punk. There you go. It has to be, right? Well, now that you've said that. Commando. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm thinking about going out and watching that movie now just to find out how the rest of the Royal Rumble is going to turn out. You see that? And they wear pants in that movie. No one goes well, commando. No, that no. you can still... You're wearing pants when you're going commando. Well, that's true. That is true. You're, 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 not, where, you're not just out there letting the polo ponies roam free. All right, but anyway, but, but <laughs> money-making promo here is what I'm trying to say to you. That's right. And if they can and a get... a good film. Thank you. Siskel or Ebert? If they can get Drew McIntyre... Siebert. ...up into Roman Reigns and L.A. Knight and Cody Rhodes and CM Punk and Randy Orton and, and Gunther and... Uh, stars... More stars than there are in the heavens. It is interesting, though, that, and we've seen a lot of this with AEW and even specifically with punk stuff, and in a lot of ways, this was similar to some of those punk segments, like punk and Eddie Kingston, punk and Adam Page before, you know, things went haywire, in that, like, there was something going on, but at least here there was, like, a direction. Like, here's a shot, the next line's gonna clearly be in kayfabe to bring us back to reality, or the reality of kayfabe, but with punk, with Drew, you have a couple guys that you could see them getting cheers. You could see them getting boos. It's not like a clearly defined, he's a baby face. Until well, Punk feuds I, with a heel, what is he? He's just a guy 
out there. He can be the devil. He can be Satan. I guess not the devil. Has AEW copyrighted the devil? Can you copyright the devil? I think God beat him to it. (laughs) He wrote the whole thing down. He said, I better trademark this shit because it's probably going to get over. But also they refer to problems they may have had previously with a, in, in their various meetings when Punk was in the WWE before and Drew McIntyre was having his first run and personal problems they may have had that you would have to be a smart fan or a very tuned-in fan to know the details of, but it doesn't sound out of place because at the same time they're not beating us over the head with it like a stick where they... You don't believe that somebody... <laughs> Hates the other motherfucker when in one sentence he blurts out, well, remember when you did this and then I said that, you did the other thing and you did that thing and I did the other thing. He's, yeah, what the fuck? When you allude to some personal slight or transgression that the other person has made and you can kind of, there's heat there. I may need to find out more about this. It sounds more legitimate, right? right. So that's all I'm saying is that they sounded like two adults that had a fucking issue. And you're right, it is amazing how when Punk gets in segments like this, that's generally what happens. Good opening. Good opening to the show. But anyway, I wish we could say we followed it up with, um, I mean, the the wrestling is not as bad as it was at one point on the show, but I wasn't at Finn Balor and Tommaso. I love Tommaso, but they ain't going to do anything with him. But there was a new look as far as production here with a champ and his little buddy same face as they're walking through the back on the way to the gorilla position to go out. They're cutting, he's cutting a live promo and then he goes through the curtain and boom, just another little, and that's nothing wrong with that. You know, last minute comments from the fighters, whatever, still no announcer, but it's something, but it's a change. But they have a a good athletic match, but it's the standard two minutes to break. They come back, they wrestle a little while, and then they do the old fucking trip and hold the leg for the baby face. The same face tripped fucking Finn and held his leg and Tommaso one, two, three, and that was it. Did you watch any of Kofi Kingston and uh, what's Kaiser Wilhelm Ludwig Kaiser? What's his fucking name? It's, um... What is his name? Kaiser Roll? Kaiser. Let's just talk about Kaiser. Is it, does he use the Kaiser Roll as a Kaiser. move? He should now. Yeah. If he doesn't. But they actually halfway got a little fucking realistic heat here. At the finish of the thing, it's a grudge match from last week because they knocked out Da Vinci with the drop kick, right? Remember that? Right. And, you know, just standard drop kicks. So this was a grudge match. But finally, they're fighting on the desk, and Kaiser's a great worker. He's just been portrayed as a stooge. But Kaiser tries to gouge Kofi's eyes out, and the referees run out to try to stop him. And Kofi gives Kaiser a big backdrop over the desk, and he takes a nice bump. And then he nails Kofi with the desk chair, and Kofi takes a big bump. And uh, Kaiser ended up putting him on the stairs, and everybody pulled him back, but he ran around the ring and drop kicked Kofi in the head. They they kicked it up a notch here. And the people were actually reacting to it halfway like, well, shit, these guys may be bleh, but this shit's good. I kind of like that. I didn't watch the segment because of the way both guys have been booked. I'll see what happens next week. I hate the New Day, so if they're doing something with Kofi <laughs> without the New Day, I'll check it out and... If they're going to try to make Kaiser serious, and I guess something like this would be the chance, the the opportunity to change it up. If he's been booked like a flunky who gets his ass kicked, and the other guy that's there with him, who's booked even worse, gets knocked out, and you could use this as an excuse to make him more of a heel, a serious heel, now's the time, go for it. He's raging against the machine. Or the Kofi. Or the Kofi. Anyway, nine o'clock comes, and there in the ring with Michael Cole is Refrigerator Jacks. And I immediately started fast forwarding because I can't listen to that voice. It gives me sable flashbacks, but in the form of a fucking overstuffed recliner couch. <laughs> and then, but then 
out came Maria Ripley. And so I've immediately stopped, and I'm going to watch now. And the fans are chanting, Mommy, Mommy. And I'm not going to... Rhea did a, a great promo. She's heads above any female promo in the business today. And she even... The, her body language and, and ex facial expressions and inflections when she... It's perfect. And there's this... Fucking blob that ate fucking Portland standing there absorbing all this. And then, oh, and by the way, I forgot, we've got a women's Royal Rumble too. I should have realized. I try to put it out of my mind every year, but they do it all the time, don't they? Oh, that'll be fun. They'll bring back some legends from the past. Yeah. <clears throat> dinner before dinner for an hour. So anyway. We'll get to see the Bellas complain about not being invited. And please, if if we don't have to look at Jax, I'll take both the Bellas. As a matter of fact, it looks like she ate both the Bellas. But anyway, so Rhea Ripley says, keep your name out of my mouth or whatever. she. What? You know what she said? It wasn't said. that. <laughs> she oh. said, keep my name out of your mouth. And... The refrigerator spoke in the sable voice. She should never speak. If they're going to use her as a large killing machine, which she may very well be in real life, at least give her a manager. But she's going to pick Rhea when she wins the Rumble. And I hope to God that doesn't take place. Because I'm afraid. <laughs> if Rhea Ripley gets hurt, I will never enjoy women's wrestling ever again. But then they followed that up with a girls tag team match, Playa. And then... That was good. By the way, I did watch that. Oh, come on. I got into that by the end and so did the crowd because it was ridiculous. They hit... How do I describe it? A top rope Frankensteiner. Like the team... I mean, it looked incredible. And the girl kicked out it too. I couldn't believe it was the most incredible thing I've ever seen any of the women do in a WWE ring. And they kick and the girl and Chelsea Green kicked at it too. Amazing. Amazing. Should have done a hospital angle. I've never seen any <laughs> I've never seen any woman in WWE take that move. It looked incredible. Two count. The match went on another 10 minutes. Two count. <laughs> Two count. See, it can happen anywhere at any time. Explain to me if you can, Lucy. I know we skipped a week, and they had a best-of show over the holidays. We were trying to get some, if I only had some peace. But now our truth is apparently he wants to be a member of the Judgment Day. He's acting like he's in the Judgment Day. And he did a comedy video where he loves all the Judgment Day, especially Dom and Nick Mysterio. I never met Nick, but hey. <laughs> and his head is... I don't know why I got so entertained by this, but I did. I hate to admit it. I did. But it, that's what I'm going to ask you. His head is on the pictures of the Judgment Day. Cause he beat J.D. last week, so now he thinks J.D. McDonough is out of the uh, the Judgment Day, and he's in his place, and it's this whole... But this is supposed to be the top heel group. Why do they have a guy that's done comedy for whatever you've seen him for the past five years come in and start having him interact? with what's supposed to be the top heel group. I don't know. Uh, uh, unless, unless somehow it's going to go somewhere. I don't know where it could go. But I will admit I was entertained by this. And I usually don't like his stuff. But I think because they are so serious, and he's the exact... Usually it's him being goofy with other goofy people. The Does he have a big buddy that they can kill him and the big buddy can come to try to get even? A big buddy for our truth? Yeah. The guy's like 55 years old. Who's his big buddy? Well, God, does somebody will draw some money? Has he had a big buddy in WWE? And not really. I, I well, don't. that's the thing. Is it Vince Martin, McMahon. He, he, I mean, he's, they've been doing comedy with him for the 24-7 title a few years ago that they do for the internet or whatever, right? I don't know what the fuck's... The point is, he does this. They go to the Judgment Day locker room. And old J.D. Funko is pissed off, but Priest thought it was kind of funny. But then Rhea steps in. And they're, they're, again, they're in the back in, 
in their lair or wherever it is with the moody lighting. And so now Rhea says, well, when's somebody going to handle our truth? And Priest says, all right, all right, I'll take care of it. And Finn is pissed off at Champa and Johnny, same face, but Priest is really pissed off at Drew, but Rhea says, I'm going to handle Refrigerator Jax, and Rhea then tells JD to handle Miz. And I'm like, Christ, they're fucking busy. Are they... And if there was... Are they getting lazy now? I'm not talking about the talent. I'm talking about the writers. They've got this cool-looking group of people, plus JD and Finn, for that matter. And they're just putting a camera in, in their secret meetings where they, the leader, Rhea Ripley, gives instructions in, in like just like that. You handle this guy, you handle that guy, you handle the other guy. I, instead of trying to do it any other way, is this laziness on the part of the the creative team? I don't know. It is interesting. I mean, they don't have a lot of heels on this show. You can think of a lot of people that are kind of clear-cut baby faces or are popular. Drew's, I guess, kind of a heel now. But they're heels, and they have a problem with Drew. When Rhea's a baby face, except when she's with this group, and then they'll still cheer her, but the rest of them, except for Priest, who you can tell is going to kind of yeah. branch off on his own. So is there anybody left to dislike anymore? Well, the problem is in these backstage segments, we get the concerned Rhea Ripley. Now, she's good at it, but again, she's a tough, bad mommy in one thing, and then she's like, Priest, I'm really worried about you. You're like, what is this backstage? <laughs> and then everything's like, I'm the leader. <laughs> Dominic, I'm the leader. <laughs> She's a compassionate dominatrix. She'll 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 stop on yellow. I will say they got me with the Nick Mysterio. That cracked me up. <laughs> it's just such a ridiculous throwaway thing, and it really is funny. Hey Dominic, what's your problem? Every every <laughs> Rhea. <laughs> <laughs> it's just them talking to each other, but they always have to say the person's name because that's the way you do wrestling TV. Oh, yeah, it's part of good television. Uh, well, anyway, that's what's going on with them right now. And then we followed that up with The Miz, who is now a raving babyface. Um, after being the loudmouth, fucking whiny, bitchy, conniving, cutthroat, whatever the case. Now he's, he's a fun-loving babyface. And he wrestled J.D. Funko. And uh, our truth came to ringside, and somehow the story that the announcers were telling was that our truth distracted JD and Dominic, even though he was just standing there not really doing anything. And then Miz beat JD, and then our truth held Miz's arm up, and the rest of the Judgment Day in the back was pissed. And that was the. And that's what we need. The Miz and our truth being the team to go after the judgment. Yeah. <laughs> ah, so anyway, the promo that people were long awaiting that we were about to come up on, um, that uh it was it just a one week thing with old gender Mayhall, or was he gonna gonna get a shot? And Seth Franklin Rollins comes to the ring, and so immediately I start fast-forwarding, but as soon, all of a sudden, at, right at 10 o'clock, here comes Jinder Mayhall, and I said, they're going to give him a chance at this. This might continue. And he comes out again, he's in the suit, and he's a, he's a big motherfucker. You know, he's got the size going for him. And the first thing he says is, I was more revolutionary last week in five minutes then you have been Seth Rollins, the revolutionary in five years. And I'm thinking, boy, they've got here. He's really going to tee off on him now. And Brian, could, they backed up on it. Could you tell they backed up on it? What do you mean by that? Because on the, on, on the anti-American stuff? The anti-American. Last week, he set it up perfect for Rock, and that's why the people got wet, and he started getting some rumblings. This week, he still did a good job with what he delivered, but he he, he, he threw away kind of some stuff like, oh, Portland, your streets are full of degeneracy, and uh, Seth Rollins, you want to entertain these clowns and push their agenda of degeneracy or whatever. You've got degeneracy on every street corner. 
what is degeneracy? What is a bunch of people whacking off like in San Diego on the state? It'd be cold this time of year in Portland. Bum fucks. That's where you, you know, that, that ought to be a video series where you just go around and see if you can find video of bums fucking on the streets. That should not be a video series, no. But he was bitching because Seth wouldn't give him a title shot. And he was just talking like, oh, and you people are, it almost sounded like he was going in the right to censor fucking mode. You see what I'm saying? And it was fine. It was okay. But it really didn't get heat like last week, and there was some minor whatting and some level of indifference to this. And I know it's because The Rock was in the ring last week and not, but still it was a difference in the material. He didn't go for anybody's throat as far as you American swine. And that's what I was hoping I'd see. I didn't think they were going to do it a second time like that because I didn't think you could. It was kind of one of those things, get it all out one time, because if it continues week after week, it's going to cause problems by week three. And they toned it back so it is a little bit more like, uh, you know, almost like the Dutch Mantel faction years ago. They have problems with what's happening, but they're not just coming out and saying the national anthem in another language. But see, that's another example of what I've always said. That's why wrestling shouldn't be on national television. Well, I mean, unfortunately, there isn't too much other television nowadays (laughs) other than that. But the, you know, the other thing is, I thought it was a good promo. Again, not every crowd's going to be the same. I believe they wanted him to go out there and get as much heat as possible to make the Rock thing as wonderful as it was for Rock. Oh, fans. yeah. So you're not going to do that every week because then... I'm not saying the same thing. I'm saying, saying say something different in the same vein. Hey, him calling out Rollins was good. Now, Rollins has been called out by a few guys in promos in the last year, but I thought this one was one of the more interesting Rollins things. And there is a little bit of history with these two, as we talked about earlier. Uh, from Tony Khan's tweets. I'll tell you, Tony Khan's <laughs> getting Jinder Mahal over more than WWE is even at this well, point. Well, yeah, as a matter of fact, think about this. Tony Khan has gotten Cody Rhodes and <laughs> Jane Cargill and CM Punk and Jinder Mahal ready to fucking make some real money in the business and main event for the big boys. Watch the next time WWE runs Jacksonville. Jinder Mahal's going to be in the fucking main event. <laughs> I promise you that. <laughs> Watch that happen. But this was well, good. Again, well, it, it was a good promo, yes. Yeah, but the but, other thing, he got beat by The Rock. You had to do something to well, get everyone's mind. You got reintroduced to him. You didn't like him. Then it became The Rock's moment. You're going to use him again the next week. You had to do something to get people's mind off the fact he got his ass kicked. Well, so what'd they do? Well, he let Rollins know that he doesn't like him. And then they kicked his ass. <laughs> and then they kicked his ass. <laughs> Because I swear to God, they had the good promo and Seth fucking, uh, or he had the good promo and then Seth responded by saying, yes, I agree, you've been overlooked. It was on purpose. And he verbally dismissed him like he was a job guy and told him off for getting up in his face and then he dared gender mayhaul over and over, hit me, hit me, hit me. And Jinder wouldn't do it, even though he's standing there with two inches or three inches and fucking 40 pounds or whatever on him. And finally, when, as a heel would, when Seth turns his back, then he fucking hits him, gets five seconds of heat, and Seth fights back, and Jinder Mayhall rolls out to escape his wrath. And that was the end of that. If he'd have goddamn dared him to hit him, And then he had tried face-to-face, and Seth had ducked and fucking hit him with a flurry and a big boom and took a bump and come up, and somehow the guy had just fucking kicked him and the balls poked him in the eye and then give him a pile driver and drop him on his fucking head and spit on him. Then I'd like to see that. But now I don't give a fuck. Because he got told off and beat up by The Rock, and that got him a lot of attention. And then he comes out to challenge this fucking champion and he gets told off and beat up again. Who the fuck is writing this shit? Paul Levesque. Hey, well, man. then what the... F- <laughs> Seth can't get beat up for a week or two and then he can come back and beat him up then when they pay for it or the, the premium live event? What do you think of the fact that a few times now the crowd either kind of groans a little or just stays silent like awkwardly 
when Rollins says that over the last year he's established his belt as being the most important belt in wrestling. No yeah. one, he did <laughs> no it again one. here, and like the crowd's just like, no, no, <laughs> that's not true. Nobody agrees. Nobody, because it's not, and it's Romans, and that's been the the thing we've said since the start. They were going to think that, and they still think that, and we think that because everybody thinks that this is a, a belt they made up and put it on a guy after a tournament on TV or whatever the fuck. So I, you know, but anyway, um, thanks for coming, gender. We barely knew ye, but I don't really see what threat he is at this point or I, I don't see him getting stabbed in the future by an angry fan like i would have last week if they'd have kept this going well i don't think they wanted that kind of reaction that's not wwe like but let me ask you this considering this happened and then the tony khan outburst about gender happened after this do you think that affects the way they use him next week or going forward well i think they've still probably got something planned for him it's just not going to work like it would have if they'd actually made him credible this week maybe he's gonna come back next week and fucking just beat the shit out of seth i don't but i think the the time was there you know they should have they should do it when it was there they should have him get a lot of money and buy that bag off cm punk and next week just reveal the aew championship and hold <laughs> it in the air what do you think of this tony Hey, I'll tell you what, with Jinder Mayhaw, because the people that you're going for with the foreign menace, they're going to they're gonna be sitting there going, he's one of them Arabs, right? We don't like him. What about do what the Iranian assassin did in Tennessee? Old Jack Cougar. He worked preliminaries for Bruiser as Jack Cougar. His real name was Jack Kruger. He got into business yeah. driving Bruiser's ring truck. He was the sketchiest looking referee in WWE history. I was a Oh my God. Yeah, because he would drive the ring truck for them after that. But in 81, 82, he worked as the Iranian assassin here in Tennessee because that was during the hostage crisis and or right after and all that shit, and there was the oil embargo and gas prices, all that shit had been in the news for several years, and he would come out, he had the fucking chic curly-toed boots, and he had the fucking headdress that he would wear, but he just wore black tights, and he had one word written on the ass of his tights, oil. And <laughs> fuck you, motherfucker! Every, every time people filled up at the gas station, they'd think of, you no good son of a bitch. But yes, Tony's tweets have gotten gender over. I think his own company should support him a little better by letting him beat the shit out of somebody here before too long. But apparently they're getting the tweets, but they're not getting the message. You know, Brian, that's a problem sometimes. You can get your tweets, but you don't get the message. And you know what? Sometimes people pay a fortune to get these tweets and messages. But if you don't get your tweets, you don't get your messages, and especially if you don't get your phone calls, well, you're just up shit creek without a paddle, as Mama Cornette used to say. That's right, with a non sequitur. Well, she never rode <laughs> in a canoe with one of those type of people, whether it was up shit creek or any other one. I'll, I'll, she would stay away from low class individuals like those non sequiturs. Would Mama Cornette have a cell phone? Only reluctantly that she would keep in her car as I do in case she was late or got lost and needed directions or in case of emergency. She was a big in case of emergency person. Otherwise, I think she it, once every three days, the phone in this house would ring when she lived here. Once every three days, you'd hear the phone ring and she'd go, well, who the hell can that be? Why can't people leave me alone? <laughs> well, I guess to talk about this, a lot of people don't want to be left alone. They want to talk to their friends and family or text them or tweet them, whatever yes. it may be. And for those who are social and want to be in touch with people, we have a wonderful friend to tell you about. Well, that's because I said you got to get the tweets, you got to get the messages, and you got to get the text, and you got to get the picture. You really got to get the picture, and that's what you can get all of that with Mint Mobile. For only $15 a month. Now, you may be paying hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of dollars, from what I understand, for your wireless plan. That's because everybody's got to have a computer in their pocket these days. Well, if you're one of those people, and by the way, you know, they've proven, it's been scientifically proven that if you have a cell phone to the side of your head for long enough, that the radio waves will rewire your brain and you'll become 
addicted to Cheetos and want to stand on your head in a pile of shit all the time. That is That's not, been scientifically proven. And it absolutely has not been scientifically proven or any other way proven. That is but, not a fact. But that's why big wireless got together. They're sending signals to your brain to buy their products. That's why only a brainless nitwit would pay hundreds of dollars a month for a wireless plan when you get it from Mint Mobile for $15 a month. Don't let big wireless send impure thoughts into your brain courtesy of your cell phone. Go to Mint Mobile. They don't have a thought amongst them. And that's, that's why they're selling this stuff for so cheap. $15 a month when you get a three-month plan? Well, that's three months for $45. That's 33 and a third percent per month. And that's for unlimited talk, text, and data. And you can't beat that unless you just don't talk to people, which is a preferable thing to do, but something that most people can't accomplish. So Mint Mobile will rescue you with premium wireless plans for just $15 a month. Say bye-bye. To the overpriced wireless plan, you get unlimited talk, unlimited text, unlimited high-speed data. It's going to come at you fast. So if you don't have anything to cover up with, get a garbage can lid or something, or just duck under a piece of furniture, because they're going to be yeeting this shit at you, this data, as fast as they can. And it's the nation's largest 5G network. And they got that going for them. What does that mean, Brian? That means for every one George Wells of another phone company, they have five. Well, Master G, the 5G. largest Master 5G network, and you can use your own phone if you want that thing anymore after it's been contaminated by big wireless. Well, no, the phone is fine. You can use your phone. Let's not mislead people and make them think they're going to have to go do something different. You can use the phone you have now. Dip it in some peroxide or no, some formaldehyde. Do not, do not do anything like dipping it in any sort of solution or water that will kill the phone. Well, you want to, it wasn't how you want to kill the germs. You want to, you want to uh, de-germanize that thing. But you don't do it by dipping the whole thing in peroxide that would kill the phone. You have to okay, well, get a peroxide pad just, and maybe wipe, not peroxide, rubbing I would, alcohol. I would say spray it liberally over the screen. And, folks, again, you can bring your existing contacts along with you. If you have contact with people, they'll have to take a short sexually transmitted disease test to make sure that they won't contract others. But then you can bring your existing contacts on over to this plan. And, again, $15 a month right now if you go to mintmobile.com slash JCE. $15 a month on that three-month plan unlimited everything all the time guaranteed at mintmobile.com slash jce additional taxes fees and restrictions apply you can see mint mobile for details we don't have those here no we don't but once again mint mobile we thank them for joining the show great service once again what's that promo code jim well, it's a slash, J-C-E. Slash J-C-E. You just go to mintmobile.com and then you slash the, the J-C-E. A lot of people have been using extra sharp knives on their computers, and that's causing damage with the screens. We suggest you don't slash the J-C-E that way. Uh, certainly not, and hopefully no one would. I don't know why anyone would, but let's slash our way back in the raw. Hopefully we're almost done with this show. Well, we certainly are because then we had Otis and Ivar. For Plowboy Frazier's old super heavyweight championship belt that he had made for himself. And then we came to the main event, and real briefly, it, it, I'm sorry I can't get shaky Nakamura. I cannot. And especially, not only the way he's been presented, but just the way he looks is off-putting to me with the jerking and the spasming about on the entrance and the fact that, again, he looks so frail. and. I'm afraid that every time he falls down, he's going to bust into fucking clouds of dust and a hearty hi -yo, shaky. This is ridiculous. He's not frail. He's a healthy gentleman. I don't know why you keep focusing on. Well, I mean, for heaven. You make him sound like a 95-year-old man with a cane who's bent over. The AARP people are waiting to take him as a spokesperson if he'd just go ahead and retire. Anyway, they had 25 minutes of a street fight with Cody Rhodes and Shaky Nakamura. And as a good reporter, I decided I'd skip to the finish to see who 
one or if anything pithy and pertinent happened. And by the time that I made that notation, they had gone back to the entranceway for no good reason, fought back to ringside and fought everywhere but the ring and introduced a kendo stick into play. And so I said, well, fuck, I'll go ahead and fast forward this thing. And I did. And I was trying to go to the finish, as I said, to see who would win. And I accidentally looked down at my notes and it went too far and it fucking went to the end of the thing and I would have had to have started it and fast forwarded all the way through again. And I didn't want to do that. So I looked it up online and Cody won. There you go. And there you go. Nakamura not going to get a chance from Jim. I like the graphics. They had very cool visuals all throughout the show building up this match. And they were both hoping you would watch it. <laughs> they let me know. They said, we hope Jim gives us a fair shot. But, but, but well, I'm sure Cody did, but, but shaky sent you a video in Japanese with English subtitles asking for that. Correct. Cause that's, that's his motif, which I appreciate. Cause that means I can watch it on mute and just do something else in the background and just read what's being said. But I well, see, thought- I, I look at it the other way. I'm like, if, if a guy's going to do an interview, I want to be able to not have to look at every second of the screen to know what the fuck's going on. I don't want to read the interviews. Well, we won't have to. <laughs> and, uh, that was it. Cody versus Nakamura. And that was it. WWE raw. We'll see. There's a few interesting things to see what happens next week, but Jim moving on here with this show. Yes. Something that broke in the last day. Let me read you this. It's not my fault. I wasn't anywhere around. Well, we don't know. Time will tell the rapper, the performer DJ Wu kid. You may remember he's been on AEW a few times in the past. Cause each time you said, who the hell is that? I said, th- well, I remember on many occasions saying who the hell is that? But I'm, I, I'll take your word for it, that it was him. He was at all in. He was a part of Swerve Strickland's entrance on that show. He was recently on the Jim and Sam show. And this is what he said. Here's a quote. You already know what happened in the back. It was straight brawl city. I'm not going to talk about that. (laughs) Blood and killing and death. What? You might as well say it. I was right there. We were next. They put us to be ready to go. It was like the moment for AEW, and I guess he, being punk, tried to sabotage that moment. (laughs) He wasn't trying to go out there. I'm in the middle. You know me. I'm the fly on the wall. It was very intense. I always thought it was fake and shit. It's more real. That shit's, excuse me, the shit that's crazy is there was a yelling moment where he, Samoa Joe, was like, fuck this shit. This is our moment. Everybody get the fuck out of there and do your shit. (laughs) And I was like, I don't wrestle, but I was about to go out there. Uh It was very intense. I will always respect wrestling after I saw that. The big guy, the Hawaiian-looking guy, (laughs) it was the guy going ham, and I was like, oh, shit. It was the guy going ham? It's an expression. Then blood was everywhere from the fight before that. What? They came in, and they were bleeding, and I was like, what is going on here? Oh, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. From the match where they did the glass spot and dipshit cut his back but that wasn't like a goddamn bloodbath it was a pap smear wasn't it unless he is saying that cm punk bloodied up jack perry really badly well it i don't know what he's saying to be honest with you i haven't figured out what he's saying yet but go ahead well let me uh it actually cuts off there but let me see i saw another quote let me go to this one (laughs) he said killing and death and shit I don't, I, if he's telling me, if he's giving his eyewitness account of what he saw, everybody's safe. Cause I don't have a fucking clue what he's talking about. Otherwise that he was scared cause he thought wrestling was all fake. And Jim, it appears that a lot of different people have reported this different ways. I saw something that said Tony Khan started yelling at CM Punk to get the fuck out of <laughs> there and wrestle. But I see another report that says it was Samoa Joe that he was talking about. <laughs> But here's someone who apparently doesn't have an NDA who can talk about what happened 
in London with CM Punk. Well, no, he fired. may not have an NDA, but I don't think he can talk about anything that happened anywhere if that's the way he gives eyewitness descriptions of shit. Huh. DJ, who? Wait a minute. How can he not be the fucking spokesperson? There comes Flair with the box of woo wings. Hey, woo kid. You want some woo wings? Well, here I have another person who transcribed it. He confirmed there was a huge brawl and that the big Hawaiian looking dude was trying to break it up. Woo kid says that Tony Khan was screaming at punk, saying something about him ruining this moment for everyone. <laughs> and to get the fuck out there and wrestle. <laughs> so scared for his life, Tony Khan yelled that he was ruining the moment. Yes. And to get out there and wrestle. Well, we're glad to get that clarified from uh, an, an unimpeachable source like the Woo Kid. Well, you know, I guess on that topic, before we get to the Dynamite review, talking about things that there's some clarity on, there's no clarity on what happened there. There's so many things in AEW that there's never any clarity on, and because of that, nothing goes away. You know, we're still talking about Brawl Out. I mean, we always will. We're still talking about the fact that someone named it Brawl Out. <laughs> All this time later, it's still the biggest story in AEW. The Chris Jericho story, we talked about this. This hasn't gone away. We'll talk about in Dynamite how they tried to make people not hear the reaction he would get from their seemingly most loyal fans in Jacksonville. That was a hot crowd for them. Hometown crowd. Hometown crowd. Not large, but hot. Jim, I'm going to report on a story that broke overnight. Let me just say for the record, I had nothing to do with this. I don't know who this reporter is. I've never spoken to him, so he did his own research, but a lot of people, specifically in the Cult of Cornet Facebook group, have been sending this in uh, because, obviously, it ties into something we just talked about on the show. A reporter named Cassidy Haynes of Bodyslam.net reports that on the second Chris Jericho Rock and Rager at Sea, which is what he calls his cruise, that hip name, the Rock and Rager at Sea. Rock and Wrestling Rager at Sea. Excuse me. In January 2020, a confrontation took place between Chris Jericho on his cruise ship and MVP. And according to the reporting of Cassidy Haynes, MVP, for one reason or another, knocked out Chris Jericho on his very own cruise ship. And that is now out there, and it's being reported, and... You alluded to that here last week or sometime recently on the program, because I guess, now that you mention it, that didn't get wide reporting at the time. Did I remember hearing about that, and that, and didn't, as a result of that, didn't... Didn't they have a, a, a verbal altercation of some description at a hotel here about a year and a half ago or what, however long oh. ago. Um, yeah, maybe even an, an, an elevator altercation where there was yelling and contratemps uh, occurring. Well, from what we were told, Jericho basically ran from MVP and then as the elevator door closed and MVP was at least trying to have some kind of discourse, I don't know if it would have turned into a fight again, Jericho said, I don't fight jobbers right when the door closed. That's what it was. Is that yeah. a bitch move or is that not a bitch move? Is that is that like I got the last line, so ha ha or Well, you know what? But to know it's a risky thing because some of those elevator doors, they don't have the same timing. So you can't really be sure. And plus the guy could have the presence of mind to fucking hit the goddamn door open button and then well, there you are. Cause now because of the handicapped people, they have to ruin everything. You can't get elevator doors that close quickly anymore. Jim, let's talk about wrestlers getting knocked out on their own vehicles, whether it's a plane or a boat. <laughs> Train, boat, car, but no, but so <laughs> the point is, whoever, whoever this, whatever type of conveyance that they choose to putter putter around in, but no, I've heard that story, I, but I've, it's been so long ago, as you said, 2020, and I've, Forgot that it, it wasn't really widely reported at that time. I didn't say anything about it because I just heard the story. We didn't have confirmation or whatever, but uh, apparently now there's more people saying this. 
And again, that was one year after the AEW title was stolen from him the night he won it. <laughs> when he went out <laughs> drinking for some reason. So and it, well, it, it, you know, but hey, the thing is, he could have forgot to lock the door of the car or, you know, whatever the case. He had a driver. Oh, the driver could have actually the limo driver that Crockett got for me in the Midnight Express with when we did publicity in New York before the first show locked his keys in his fucking limousine. We had to sit at a McDonald's for an hour and a half. But nevertheless, nevertheless. So now uh, that makes uh, MVP and Jericho in the in in their uh, career altercations. We got uh, Jericho's 0 for 1, MVP's 1 for 0. And that shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. MVP's a bit of a badass from everything <laughs> I've ever heard. <laughs> He's, Who wants to pick a fight with him? I don't, well, I don't, I mean, he is, he is trained and et cetera. I don't know if he would. Yeah. I don't know if he'd consider himself an adopted member of the Gracie family, but look at Jericho. I don't think it'd be a fucking issue. That episode was called Dr. Roxo Goes Down. <laughs> But Jim, on the topic of going down, AEW Dynamite disseminated again, once again this week. Two agains, now three. From Jacksonville, from Daly's Place, a place that we saw a lot of wrestling during the pandemic. It has a different setup when there's a lot of fans there. But back at what I guess we could say is the real home of AEW, Jacksonville and Daly's Place for Dynamite. Boy, howdy. At least they can set that place up where it looks full. I guess it's adjustable. They just stick the ring in front of the stage and got a branch out. They don't have to draw the camera any farther back than they need to. But I mean, this is... Remember when I said about the WWE writing team never coming to visit us at OVW in Louisville, but I said it's probably just as well because I would have either needed five minutes or five years. Anything in between won't do us any good. I th It's the same. I could... I could talk about what was wrong with this program all day, but it would just depress me. So I'm, I'm going to instead just try to ask some of the questions that the fucking fans watching were asking and just bring some of these things up as we try to recount the high and medium points and potentially low points of this program. Because I don't know what he he's lost his mind or somebody else is telling him to do something or somebody's not there that needs to be there. I don't know what the fuck's going on. But the the show starts with Hangnail Page against Claudio Castagnoli. Out of nowhere, it, both of them are baby faces, right? Allegedly. Well, Blackpool Combat Club, it depends on who they're wrestling. Well, but have they had any problem with each other? Did we miss something? It was, was it on rampage and everybody missed it? I believe Adam page said he was going to save AEW from Claudio. No, that's okay, someone well, else. That's someone else. Well, what the, it's as far as we, it's a cold match and page when he comes out, by the way, his graphic where he is, he's making his 2024 AEW debut, Adam page. It says habitually late for work. So it's all a joke to them. It's all a joke. Would you see that on the WWE program? Would you see it in the UFC? Would you see it in baseball? Or would you see it in basketball or any major sports program? No, it's a fucking joke. They're kids and they've got the key to the candy store and they like to play and pop each other. And then Paige jumpstarts it and attacks Claudio. And they immediately fight to the floor. Why? And they will not get in the ring for any reason. So I fast forwarded some. And I, st I see they've ruined Claudio's work now because he's throwing horrible fake forearms right back at the other fight. Claudio, if he hit this fucking guy one time as he could, Paige wouldn't get back up until his kids were dizzy. As I fast forwarded some more through the break, they were fighting on the entrance stage. Why? And they did flipping spots on the floor. Why? A moonsault off the stage to the floor. Why? It's a cold match happening for no reason amongst two kind of sort of baby faces, and it's going forever. And finally, Paige wins with two buckshot lariats. But he hit the first one. 
and he didn't even bother going for a cover. He jumped up, but of course that was okay because Claudio jumped up too and turned around and to the other side so that Paige could jump out the other side and hit him with a second buckshot. So what the fuck? This guy kills his own finish. He's a fucking idiot. Because I'm sure Claudio didn't say, give me your finish, and then I'll just pop right back to my feet before you could even cover me, and you can give me another one, and then you can beat. What the fuck? And by the time this thing was over, we were 20 minutes into this show. What, what does it all mean, Brian? It's a homecoming show for the Jacksonville fans. They were a hot crowd. Gotta give them that. They really reacted to Adam Page. It's the best reaction I've seen a crowd have to Adam Page in, in as long as I can remember. I mean, yeah. really, in as long as I can remember, it was a hot crowd for him. How many people was in that building, you think? That's another story, because apparently they sold... I saw something, I want to say it was around... If the capacity for this event was 2,300 tickets, they sold them but they filmed it so that it looked like there were 400 people there. That's what I was going to say. I didn't see anybody. Yeah, no, that's the weird thing, because I was following from WrestleTix the information about how many tickets were being sold or distributed. It was almost a sellout last time I checked, or a sellout, just about. And you watched the event, and it was a dark building. It's an outdoor building, too. But it didn't look like that there were that many people there, and apparently they had a few thousand people there. Well, that's what I said. They could set it up and set the ring right in front of the stage and make it look full, but I thought they had like fucking maybe 800 people or whatever. You couldn't see. All right. But then, anyway, then the first of the insanity came upon us. They did a package about Brody Lee, which is fine, remembering Brody Lee. But it wasn't a package, unfortunately. It was it was video, but it was voiced over by Sockface in the most awkward voiceover ever. It was, I mean, he's not professional, so you can't say it was unprofessional because you would expect that. But it was just bad, and somehow he was supposed to tie the two eight person tag team matches that we have tonight into Brody Lee's memory and for said they're memor memorializing him because he was here back in the Daly's Place era during the pandemic, whatever. But it was this the loosest grasping of a way to not only honor a guy, but to figure out a way because he had friends in the eight man an eight-person tag match, eight-woman tag match, and a person. Do you see what I'm saying? Was this awkwardly put together for two more cold matches for no reason? Well, I think so for a few reasons. One, if I missed it, I apologize, but did they even say this is the anniversary of his passing or anything? Because I didn't hear that. It was and just no, all of a sudden the video started rolling. They started talking about him. I and don't then they think said it's in, an anniversary of anything besides that they're in Daly's place. Well, then they said as a tribute to him, they're going to have in these random eight-man matches, one of his chosen people, Preston Vance and Anna Jay. Again, it's weird logic behind it. There had to be another way to do a tribute to Brody Lee. and Well, and, and, and that's the way he first uh, uh, tried to describe it. Sock face, <laughs> Excalibur for the new listeners. And then during the eight man, the announcers, they were saying, well, all of the babyface team were friends of and bonded with Brody Lee behind the scenes or blah, 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 or whatever the fuck, which is, which is again, here's the eight man tag. Brian Cage, Tia Leone, Bishop Khan, and Lance Archer with Prince Nana and Jake Roberts at ringside in the world's most massive tuxedo. It, it looked like one of those goddamn what do they call him? The, the frilly thing that goes around the mattress? He had used that as his cummerbund. And the babyface team, a duvet possibly, was Pockets, Dustin Rhodes, Preston Vance, and Edge. Edge, Edge, is in a fucking random eight-man tag match with jobbers. He hadn't been there for two months. It, it, and the reason was given, well, Edge and Brody Lee both loved 
some the, some hockey team. I'm like, what the fuck is this? Like when Stone Cold Steve Austin teamed up with Mantar because in real life they were both friends of Brian Pillman. What the fuck? They've devalued Edge now, putting him with the fucking mascot and this idiot jobber Preston Vance, who even in their own story is a heel. And they said the reason why that Tony booked Preston Vance on that team was to bring him into the light. Like, they even see the light and become a baby face. And now we know that Edge doesn't care because he's just taking the money and there's no stress, and he knows it doesn't matter what he does, but it won't change anything. He said, because, it, he said it the first night they brought him in at that press conference. It's like being on the indies again. It, it, if he was... Uh, Obviously, if he was thinking about himself in terms of his star power, his aura, his, you know, standing in the community and wrestling, he would say, no, I'm not going to go out in this eight-man tag and team with these fucking, well, Dustin Rhodes, nothing matter with him, but team with this fucking moron and this job guy to work with these fucking goofs that aren't over. What are you, crazy, Tony? But instead, he says, oh, okay, that'll be cool. And so, and then Edge speared somebody, and then Preston Vance clotheslined the guy and pinned him. Vance got the pin. Like, there's some way you can, he still looks like he's the most confused motherfucker in the room. Nothing he does looks good. And he looks like he doesn't even know what he's doing when he does it. He's awkward and clumsy and colorless and bland. And what the fuck? He's got the right roommates. Actually, not even. Not anymore, unless he's playing football, I understand now. So... Yeah, it really helped that team uh, in the last couple months, didn't it? Well, you never know when these people get transferred. It takes them a while to find their grip on on things. But anyway, that was that eight-man tag team match with Edge. Should we go on? The crowd wasn't as hot as it had been for the first <laughs> match. and unfortunately. You know, whatever you want to say about Preston Vance, he hasn't shown it. Whatever he has, if it's more than we've seen, he hasn't shown it. I and think those, he's got Polaroids is what he's got. And those fans didn't really react. I mean, he's teaming up with Pockets, who, to that fan base, is a star. Edge is a big star. Dustin, he's a sentimental favorite amongst those people. And then a the guy who is the other guy in the Los Faction. What, what are they? Los Faction. L- La fuckers and goobers. That's them. And they just threw him in this match and they gave him the pin. And the reasoning that the owner of the company wanted to bring the heel into the light. Maybe someone needs to bring Tony into the light. <laughs> go into the light. No, no. On the drugs, Tony's on you. Don't go into the light. Don't go into the light. Anyway, uh, moving along quickly over a couple of things. The Gang Bang Gang and the Acclaimed and Billy Gunn were talking to each other about potentially becoming a super faction. And I'll, I'll be horrified by that when it happens. And then we got to Samoa Joe, the new AEW world champion, in the ring for a promo in a suit with the belt. And it's a, what a fucking heel demeanor he's got and that sniff and that look he has on his face. And the crowd <laughs> is chanting, thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. He just beat MJF and it, it's part of the devil's machinations. And he's another of the most popular heels because he's one of the few people on the roster that are actually good at what they do, no matter what it is they do. Because he's a pro wrestler. <sighs> uh, but anyway, so now that we've established that Joe is another one of these popular heels, not his fault, folks. It's the atmosphere he's in. He announces the changes to the way that people are going to challenge for the title around there. No more whining. And no more ho-ass comments on Twitter. Bring your record, your reputation to the championship committee, and when they put you in the ring with me, I'll stomp your ass. And they're chanting for Joe. Hey, yeah, why not, right? When they first started chanting, thank you, Joe, his reaction, he did not expect that. Even he <laughs> couldn't hide the smile. Well, he knows. They're literally in a fucking bizarro world. 
where the more heinous things you do, I'm waiting for a guy to come out dressed as a hunter and not use a gun, but just butt fuck Bambi to death. Just butt fuck Bambi until the life leaves what? Bambi's body right in the middle of the ring. And the fans in AEW will cheer that son of a bitch. That's a very uh, interesting analogy that you... Uh, anyway, well, you can't, I can't wait to see Travis's up. thumbnail. Travis, do not incorporate any of that. Any we won't be able to use it. Wait. So they're chanting for Joe and his. they play Swerve's music. And here comes Swerve. And he's got Nana and the whole group of their heels, and they come out. And how, if they want the jobber heels to get over, how can they get any heat coming out with Swerve? Because they're going to cheer Swerve, and then they're just stooges for him anyway. But if they come out on their own and actually do something, they might get some heat. But it kind of drags Swerve down because... Why does the fucking guy that they really is the most popular guy involved here need to come out with four or five other fucking guys? What was your question? Should it just be Swerve and Nana? Yes, of course. It's ridiculous to have those. They're extraneous and it just distracts. It's, it's a, it negates some of the effect of what you're trying to do. But anyway, so Swerve says, it's like with Paige, Joe, it's not personal, it's just business, I just want the AEW title and I'm going to take it. That was his summation. He delivers his shit very well, which is why he didn't need these five guys standing behind him. But then as they go for their face-off and we're the, okay, Swerve and Joe, this could be interesting, you've been talking about it, okay. They play fucking Paige's music, and here comes the hangnail to do what all hangnails do. Be a minor pain and irritation on the side of something that's important. And I, I wrote, why is he in the way of this? And he got in, and he tried to put bass in his voice, and he growled at him, and he didn't say anything in an interesting way, but he wants the AEW title, too. So all right, oh, Jesus Christ, but Tony's fixation with three ways. He's never actually been in one in private, so he loves to book them in public. But then what they did was, after Paige events his shit, and he and Swerve get in each other's face. They were so close in each other's face, Swerve could smell his own blood on Paige's breath. Nana pulls Swerve out. No, don't, 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 don't get it. He pulls him away, and the, the heels are the first ones to leave. They got five guys. And they, well, he pulls, instead of saying, well, fuck you for disrespecting my guy. Hey, three henchmen. Come over here and help Swerve kick the shit out of this fucking cowboy. But it's so Nana pulls Swerve out and they leave. And then Paige gets up in Joe's face and he leaves. And then as Joe's standing there glorifying that he's the champion, they play Hook's music. Tone, I guarantee you, Tony said, fuck them on Twitter. He set up a world title match for Hook over this whole goddamn Twitter dressing down that he got. Didn't you see this? Yeah, I saw How this. How the fuck? It, and Hook comes out with his belt that they've given him. And he gets in the ring and gets face-to-face -face with Samoa Joe and holds up one finger... <laughs> And th they're talking to each other, but they don't have a microphone. And the announcers say, I think he just said one week. And Hook walks out. And then they announce after the break next week for the title, Joe versus Hook. And Hook has come out and given Joe an ultimatum, a timeline of what? <sighs> so not only did... They have something interesting with Swerve and Joe, even though they're both heels, they're both very popular. And because they couldn't leave that alone, they stuck hangnail in there to fucking hide off, hang off the side of it, and then confused the issue by having it, let's face it, Hook is a very minute 
small young rookie fellow next to Joe, and this shouldn't be competitive. It shouldn't be. I'm sorry, but it shouldn't be, and it probably will be, to further dilute the issue just because Tony got his feelings hurt on Twitter about how he was setting up fucking matches with Hook versus Gender Mayhall versus whatever the fuck. My God. Your thoughts? Again, Tony just complained about Jinder Mahal losing no or winning no matches for a year and getting into this thing with Seth Rollins. Adam Page lost two high-profile matches to Swerve Strickland. Swerve just lost in the tournament. Hook is a made-up title. Samoa Joe was good here. And then it turned into a bunch of challengers coming out. The Adam Page thing worries That's why me. Swerve, can you imagine if Swerve had won that tournament at least? And he could come out there draped with all those phony fucking belts with Nana, and at least it would look good, and then he wants Joe. Instead, we got Japanese jack-off fantasies amongst American people and a goddamn losing streak for everybody involved in the world title picture. What concerns me is that Adam Page has lost two times to Swerve. So my hope is that this is not to set up a third match to get a title shot against Joe and he's going to finally get his win because there's, okay. no, there's nothing right now for Adam Page versus Joe. Joe's just going to be a monster babyface. Joe versus Swerve with some build can be a good match, but it could be good TV. These are two personalities that are over and that the fans are really into. If they throw Adam Page in this to get his win back, that derails Swerve a little bit and it's unnecessary right now. But that's, as soon as he came out, that was my thought. Oh, he's going to get his win back from Swerve and get that title shot. Uh, I, I, I'm hoping they go straight to a three-way and get it over with. Because it's just, it's, it's ruined for me now anyway. Unless they can somehow get rid of Paige and, and Hook don't last long. Good Lord. But I'm, what, is Tony aware of these things, Brian? Do you think he is? Is Tony Khan aware of these things, or does he live in a bubble and he can't listen to anything that he doesn't well, agree with? I think Tony is deep inside the wrestling bubble, and there's a lot of people that are. They're big fans. No, no, no. He's not in the wrestling. He's in his own bubble. Well, no, it's, it's the wrestling bubble. It's a wrestling fandom bubble. And there's a lot of people. He's deep in it, and he doesn't understand what normal wrestling he doesn't understand why normal people like wrestling. He doesn't understand how to put together a wrestling show. He doesn't understand why people are over or who's over. He doesn't understand how to make segments make sense. He doesn't understand any of this. A lot of the lessons he learned are from fucking ECW, and they're all wrong. <laughs> Even if they work there, they work there in the time and the place, and they don't work as well when you look back. But he, does, he always does the wrong thing, and he always justifies it with, look at what Cage Match says. Those are people deep in the bubble of wrestling. Like, if the choice is between going out and meeting someone or watching the latest Japanese tape right away, tape. Watching something right away from somewhere else, they're going to do that. Like, they're deep in the bubble. That comes first. But they appreciate wrestling, or some may say don't appreciate... Well, they appreciate wrestling in a way that other fans don't, and they have a problem with anyone who doesn't see things the way they do or appreciate it the way they think they're supposed to. But in reality, they're out of step and out of touch with the wide wrestling audience. That's the issue. Tony that, is deep in the bubble. Dave Meltzer, you know, not to take a shot at him, but he's deep in the wrestling bubble. Some of these guys don't understand what the real world is like outside of 24 hours a day wrestling. And it's an unhealthy thing. Well said. And it's an unhealthy well thing. Said. It really is. Awareness of the wider surroundings. Tony needs an awareness mode. Because Tony right now is unfortunately in his own little noise-isolated bubble. And he needs to click on his awareness mode so that he can understand that the majority of people around him are going, what the fuck's wrong with you, Tony? And, you know, I think, should we chip in, Brian, and buy him a pair of the Raycon Everyday Wireless Earbuds no. so he could have his own awareness mode? No. He needs a self-awareness mode, and he's got enough money. Well, his dad has enough money. He can get his own Raycon. Well, he can get his Ray, and then he can have his own uh, in-house laboratory there, the test facility down at Jaguar Central. They can make a self-awareness mode and stick it on the Raycon wireless earbuds. Because, folks, I'll tell you what, we've talked about all the other products they've branched out into over the last year or two, but you can't go any further than the, the crown 
Jewel product from Raycon, the wireless earbuds, the optimized gel tips, the perfect in-ear fit, and you can't tell me that's what Tony doesn't have stuck in his head. He just hasn't hit the button to turn on his awareness mode because you can isolate yourself from all the noise of the outside world, all of the criticisms and the complaints and the disasters and the stresses and the ass chewings and the screamings and the backstage brawls. You won't hear a lick of that. You're going to be listening to only what you want to, just like Tony does. Only what you care to hear, just like Tony does, except yours is going to be music or news or podcasts, whereas his is Tony's the Booker of the Year on a loop 24-7. So, with the three customizable sound profiles and all these basic earbud tap functions that take you into other places and other dimensions, it's so groovy. It'll be a journey through the center of your mind when you go to buyraycon.com slash JCE and get 15% off your Raycon order, you hear the mood music creeping in. And free shipping. Buyraycon.com slash JCE, 15% off. And free shipping on the earbuds that Tony Khan obviously has surgically implanted inside his skull. Because you're not going to hear anything that you don't want to hear. Yeah, with Raycon. Yeah. But you can also hear whatever you want to hear. Well, that's another way of saying it. That's another way. Well, you, you, no, it's two different things. You can. No, you're not going to hear anything that you don't want to hear means the exact same thing as you can. You're going to hear only stuff that you want to hear There's or whatever you said. You will only hear what you want to hear. I guess, yes. I guess so. I guess that does explain yeah. it. Well, Raycon, they're great. What's that promo code, Jim? Slash JCE. And remember, we've talked about don't use a sharp knife on your computer screen. Buy, B-U-Y, Raycon, R-A-Y-C-O-N dot com slash J-C, 15% off free shipping. Listen to what you want to listen to. Oh, 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 listen to the music. Oh, God. Right now. Not that. Wait, where's silence mode or do you, do you have awareness mode on? Maybe you need that. Well, I'm aware of everything except the next line. Yeah. What was it? On a lazy morning river. All right. And right. Which doobie you be the tone deaf one? I mean, which doobie you be? That's right. It's one of the oh, greatest man. lines in the history of what's happening. Which doobie you be? <laughs> I didn't watch what's happening. I was out earning an honest living. Ah, I was in the what's happening bubble. Yeah, see, I, but, uh, that, that brief period of time, three, four days a week between the time I started going to all the wrestling shows and the time of a, of a VCR, I didn't see a lot of primetime television. And then they brought it back like 10 years later as what's happening now, but rerun was like difficult. He wanted more money, so they just dropped him. Well, thing is, there wasn't much happening. But there's more happening with Raycon. But no, there's not. We were done with that. There's, it's 9 o'clock now, Eastern. And it's time for Sammy Guevara versus Ricky Starks. And was there a reason for this fucking match, except they're going to have a tag team title match this weekend? With their various partners. Well, that does set up that match. And I guess technically on TV the last several weeks, they were on opposite sides of problems because he confronted yeah. the Don Callis family. Don Callis's family, because they're heels and Ricky Starks and Big Bill were heels, they were yeah. on the same team. It makes some sense. Yeah. All right. Well, and they did it at nine o'clock. And I think what Tony overlooked is that nobody gives a shit about Sammy Guevara anymore. Because in this one, I mean, they like Starks and they popped on the big moves, but even in the hometown crowd was, was it, there was a lot of silence here, I noticed, because I tried to watch this. But basically a popular heel and an unpopular baby face. And so Sammy beat him flat in 10 minutes with a super kick and a jackknife. One, two, three. Starks has got to be fucking chomping at the bit and biting his fingernails to get the fuck out of there. Oh, well, someone told me he has a long-term deal. I hope not. I hope that's a, I hope that's not true, but someone who knows uh, this kind of stuff told me that he'll be there for a while, which is sad. It makes me really sad to hear that. Is there no chance of parole? Possibly an appeal to the governor? What's he going to do? Punch Sammy in the face? That doesn't work. There you go. Doesn't no, work? It doesn't work. Well, maybe if he punches somebody else, they all want to punch Jungle Sammy. Jungle Boy. There you go. That's a proven. That's a proven. You punch Sammy. Yeah. You stay on another year, you punch Jungle Boy, you go home. 
That's why Jungle Boy hasn't been there. They're afraid there's going to be a line of people waiting to punch him as soon as he reappears at the show. <laughs> I've been looking to get out of this deal for a while. Come here, yeah. Jack. Yeah, one of them brings a slapjack. The other one has a fucking billy club. That's his anyway, name, anyway. Slapjack. Slapjack. I thought that was a uh, switch Perry. hitter, uh, light switch, um, slingshot. Snack stop. Um, wing stop. Wing stop Jay White. Huh. All right, we're back to this. So Sammy beats him flat in the middle, one, two, three. And then he shakes Starks' hand, and Big Bill comes in and jumps Sammy from behind, and they get a soup son of heat on young Sammy. And then Jericho's music hits so loud they probably blew the goddamn bass out of the speakers in Daly's place. And Jericho hits and makes a comeback, and they keep, it was like New Jack at ECW. The music is loud, and it's up, and it keeps going, and they get in a big four-way, and they have a sloppy, poorly shot four-way brawl throughout the arena, bouncing each other off the back wall and et cetera, to obviously hype their big tag team title match on Saturday night's Battle of the Belts. Um which apparently will take place right after collision. So you're going to have dinner and then have dinner. And I mean, they, they obviously, they kept the music up. So you couldn't hear the response that they were at least anticipating Jericho would get. I'm not sure what he got because the music was so fucking loud on the close-ups. The people that were around him seemed to want to high five him, but those are the kind of people that would high five Herman Gehring. If he walked by, so, can they play the music through the whole match on Saturday night? I don't know. I mean, his battle of the belts, he better wear a belt. He's Judas in his pants. <laughs> Look, this thing has to be addressed. They have to say what's up. They can't do this. He's not fucking New Jack. He's not New Jack. New Jack didn't look like Amy Schumer. <laughs> so you can have Jericho. No, wait a minute. Amy Schumer's hot. Come on. Well, let's not go crazy now. But you have Jericho come out there. I haven't there. seen her in a few years. Here's the problem. They played his music really loud throughout the whole thing, and every single person who saw that said they're doing it for a reason. They're doing it for a reason, to drown out the booze. Whether they expected him, or whether they heard a little bit and decided to just play it. No, this is, I mean, a premeditated thing. This is a strategy. Play this thing really loud throughout the whole thing. They can't do this every week. They have to address this one way or the other. And they could shut it down really easily by saying there's nothing there. And they won't. So this is a problem. Jericho's been silent on Twitter, apparently. That's what people are saying. I'm blocked again. So I can't even check. He unblocked <laughs> I, I, me for I, I, a while. I forgot to look. I, I don't ever pay attention. At some point, he unblocked me because I was able to respond to him the last time he acted stupid. And then he blocked me again. So I really don't know what causes him to do things. But this ain't going away. And they got to address it. You got to address it. He has a lot of time left on that contract. And he doesn't do himself any favors. You got to address this one way or the other. Otherwise, you're going to have a real problem. And right now, you need to do everything you can to get your fan base engaged and happy and not focusing on drama. Because every single week, whether it's a pay-per-view overshadowed by drama or drama that happens on social media, in many cases, led by Tony, that overshadows the show. Now, be fair. This show is easily overshadowed. But it's every week. Again, it's every single week. The chatter online is about Tony's behavior. And then anything you see on the show, people respond to it in the context of what Tony had said. He's affecting the way people watch his show. And then he puts on a bad show. And then he denies it and says it's great. Because other fans who are on the same message boards as him for the last 25 years think it's great. And in any case, when he's trying to build his brand new heavyweight champion, he complicates the issue by inserting a young rookie who we barely ever see who never speaks into a fucking world title match to get even with the people on Twitter. Well, talking about his world champion, his first world champion was Chris Jericho. What do you do? You can't do this every week. What are you going to do now with Chris Jericho? Well, I... I here's the problem. What you may need to do might not be palatable to do because. You, like you said, you need to address the situation, and it would be easy 
for him to issue a public statement that there was absolutely nothing to these allegations or accusations, except if there's something to these allegations or accusations, or maybe it's his own fault. If they signed an NDA, maybe they're not allowed to talk about it either. Did he sign a frivolous NDA for frivolous reasons? Could Chris Jericho be defended by Tony Khan? If he hadn't signed his NDA, well, then he's an idiot. And, and then Jericho would be going, hey, what the fuck? Defend me while I sign an NDA. It's your own fucking NDA. Well, whose NDA is it? Is it Chris Jericho's NDA or Tony Khan's NDA? And here's an easy way around it. If Tony Khan said, I will release anyone from an NDA that has anything to do with sexual harassment amongst talent, that ends the story. That ends it right there. Why? I mean, they're blowing it with how to handle this. And it gets to the point where you're like, the only reason to blow the way you're handling this is if there's something there. They're leading people to think there's something there by not saying that's ridiculous. Of course Tony not. will speak at length, and we've heard that, at length on things that he wants to talk about. But on the things that he doesn't want to talk about, he will go to equal lengths to not speak about them. So why don't he want to talk about this? That's it. There you go. No more lectures about other people having bad faith arguments about AEW until you can be fucking honest with your fans and the wrestling fans out there about what's going on. You don't get to say anyone else has a bad faith take on AEW. Everyone else has a good faith take. You're dishonest with the fans or you're obfuscating and not saying what's there. You're your own worst enemy. It's ridiculous. You know, if they did sign something, if whoever signed something, and it was me, I would say, if they just signed something to get her to go away, they didn't believe that there was anything to it, or it was a minor incident, or, uh, you know, no, but just, oh, get the girl to go away and not complain because we're starting this company or whatever, but nothing major or serious, you know, was wrong here. I sympathize with Jericho. Then I'd come out and say that. <laughs> I would say, look. I heard the story, and I didn't think there was anything fucking wrong that that called called for drastic measures, and we had everybody sign something, and I made young lady happy, and everybody went their separate ways. Be honest with that. Unless you just, like everything else that happens, you took somebody's word that was involved in it that you liked for what actually happened, and if there was more to it, then you can't defend that. But uh, I did. Uh, who knows what's fucking I mean, the other way, Tony's mind? The other way to say it is, if something's going on with Chris Jericho, it doesn't involve me or my company. And I'm not trying to put Chris out there. He has to answer this, but it isn't our issue. It's something with him. But if it's a company thing, that changes everything. Because I'm assuming the talent didn't leave with two NDAs. One for Jericho, one for AEW. I'm assuming that if this story is true or if there's any talent I left for an NDA, it's one NDA. It's a company-wide NDA, which would, they probably would argue, be an umbrella that would cover their talent. They got, I mean, this isn't going to go away. They got to address this. Tony can't just tell everyone how great everything is. Anyway, speaking of great matches, they didn't give us one next. It was the eight-girl tag team match, which took up almost 15 minutes of the program, and Anna Jay was a Brody Lee protege. That's why they had to have an eight-girl tag team match. Uh, Everyone had their asses out. I mean, it's just ridiculous. <laughs> well, yeah, and then the girls were as skimpily dressed as the guys were, yes. The wedgie era of wrestling. I mean, that's really what it is. Just no matter who you are, show as much ass as you can. All of a sudden, it became a thing to be a successful women's wrestler. You have to have a wedgie and make men fantasize about those cheeks. I think it worked for Yokozuna. Well, no, he covered up. He wasn't out there like Rikishi. He he had a he had a, well, that's true. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking of Rikishi. Now that I think about it, I was thinking about just seeing Yoko wandering to the shower with a towel wrapped around him. It's like a fucking parade of ass. I mean, it was ridiculous. nevertheless. It was is. I'll tell you what, sometimes when he'd walk down the street, people would tie yellow tape to his ass, just as a caution. Anyway, then Roderick Strong beat Brian Keith. And then 
Adam Cole and Roderick Strong and Matt Taven and Mike Bennett and Wardlow. Cole did a promo and tried to put the group over as somehow as legitimate after they've been used as jobbers and comedians for months. They're all dressed like bums and sweatpants. Adam Cole looks worse than all of them, like he just rolled out of bed. He looks really bad. Like he looks unhealthy. I get. I, I always feel bad about saying anything critiquing him. Because a part of me thinks he must be sick. He but looks sick. He was pale. I mean, he looks I'm sick. I'm not even talking about you can put a corpse in a tuxedo. They're not even trying to dress in any way, to look, they comb their fucking hair, trim a goddamn beard, look like professional athletes of some description. Just a bunch of fucking bums dressed in black sweats and with various sports team logos or whatever the fuck they've got on their sweatshirt. I don't know. It just, it's so drab and nobody's going to buy this shit. Nobody is buying it. Nobody's going to buy it. At least when Adam Cole was supposed to be Bearcat Lee's manager in the WWF, at least he could still walk. The fuck? They've just killed these guys. It's just stupid. Then you want to talk about the main well, event, Brian? But you well, know, go again, ahead. Again, got- too. This is their top heel faction. We got to address this. They're the well, top- we, we, we believe that based on the presentation, but I don't actually think they are because... Well, they're never going to be. What are to they going to do to anybody? He said Roderick Strong is the best wrestler pound for pound of the world today. Does any fan there believe that after watching? I get heels lie, but we're supposed to believe in this group where three of the members have been but treated like know, jokes. You're, you're actually, here's the thing. You're not even seeing how stupid that statement is because yes, heels lie and you're supposed to do that. But in this case, Roddy probably weighs 180 these days, 185. He's ripped. He's always in great shape. He may be pound for pound the best pro wrestler in the fucking business, but nobody believes it, even though it's true. So Adam Cole is out there trying to tell the truth about a guy and he's the, and he's telling the truth and the way the guy's been presented it's the most laughable thing in the fucking world to think that. That's how stupid they are. We've gone too far with Adam Cole. If he had come right in off NXT and this is what they had done, maybe it would have had a shot. But for two years, three years, whatever it's been that he's been in AEW, I'm never going to buy him as a heel. And I'm never going to buy him as a wrestler. I mean, what does he weigh? 130 pounds? I, I, I'm like you. I don't want to talk about his health because it looks so bad. but. T- Taven and Bennett and Wardlow and Roddy look fine, but if they've been and nobody like gives shit. two shits about them either. They they are in good health and they're good talents and they've been ruined. And it, it, Wardlow's been start and stop for so long; it's ridiculous. And the others never had a chance coming in, and then willingly jumped into this fucking comedy bullshit they did with both feet, and and nobody's ever going to care, not even the AEW fans. They roll their eyes at him because they don't do fucking backflips. But then came the main event of this parade of terror. I'm starting to ghost of Mr. Chicken things. Remember, we how many matches have we had on this program? What, Hangnail Page and Claudio went the floor and the fucking entrance and the stage and flipping off, and we had the, the fucking widespread fucking brawl earlier with the the Jericho's faction. It was all over the building. So now to make things completely different, a tornado tag match falls count anywhere. Anything goes lazy booking for our main event. Okay. Do they know how to do anything else? Do they... Have they ever given the thought to the idea that it might mean something if it wasn't constant, done every fucking... Sting and Darby Allen with Ric Flair in the corner against Willie Hobbs and take a shit with Don Fallis. And they did a jump start and got in a four-way and they all headed to the back of the arena. <laughs> and I said, I, I can't, I can't take this. So I started fast forwarding to skip to the finish again, right? And they went through a break. And when they came back from the break, they were actually in the ring. 
So I slowed down for a second because I said, okay, they're actually maybe going to start having a match now. And I saw where Hobbs and Take did the shitbag toss to Darby Allen from one side of the ring to the other by his arms and legs, and they spun him and almost broke his fucking neck on the ropes on the other side. And you will recall that Tommy Young, just by an errant accident, Tommy Rich tripping him, fumbling up under his feet, and Tommy falling and hitting the bottom rope with his forehead, injured his neck, and was forced to retire and had surgery. And this guy's flung from 20 feet in the air into the fucking ropes. Then Flair got in and chopped an eye, poked Hobbs, and then they started doing other shit, and Rick just turned around and stepped out. And then they were all on the stage, and Darby Allen coffin dropped Take from the top of the bleachers onto the stage, but he actually missed him, but thankfully our boy Take a Shit was able to grab him as he went by and broke some of his fall. Of course, it looked phonier than a football bat. He's our boy Takeshita. I'm not calling him Take a Shit. He deserves having his... He's good, and you keep using the worst name for him. Well, then they should goddamn have given him a proper fucking name. They gave him his name. You could just call him his name. Hey, Reggie Lasowski didn't get over, did he? But the Crusher did. He was over as Reggie Lasowski. Not like the Crusher was. All right, how about Larry Shreve? No, he was over as Abdullah. Well, there you go. And then after they tried to kill Dar Darby tried to kill himself there, then Sting, it, it, Hobbs picked Sting up and for no apparent reason except we found out at the end, picked him up and carried him along a walkway on the edge of the arena until suddenly they got to one spot and then Sting squirmed off his back and grabbed Hobbs. That's because they were over the two tables that had been previously arranged so that Sting could give Hobbs a scorpion death drop off the stage through two tables to the concrete floor and then cover him there for the referee's count of one, two, three. So, poor Sting's got a handful of matches left. They're determined to put him in a goddamn iron lung. Uh, and, and poor Hobbs was going backwards through all of that. I thought they crippled Darby when they threw him. I mean, oh. you talked about it. The throw alone, throwing someone 20 feet in the air, I don't care how much they weigh, across the ring, it's going to hurt. I mean, the older he gets, the more it's going to hurt. Well, besides that, he's out of He was spinning. He's out of control. They, he just told him, fling me, baby. But when his head hit the rope, that's where you get really scared. Well, if, if you go back and you slow-mo it, he was lucky enough that he landed somewhat, uh, I, it's hard to describe without seeing the video and the frame by frame, but he landed somewhat that was able to impede his momentum and he didn't actually go neck first like it looked like in fast motion was snapping the rope. The rope sprung and things happened, but he was... He was an inch maybe away at that, and at that speed, it would be a fraction of a second. Yeah, I mean, one of the worst things I've ever seen in my entire life was that Pero Aguayo Jr. video, where you know whatever happened, he hit oh. the rope and his neck snapped. And yeah, yeah, it wasn't this violent. If Darby had broken his neck, if Darby ended up in a wheelchair, I bet he would still make the pay per view. <laughs> Sting, I thought they almost killed. No, they're trying to kill Sting. Darby's trying to kill himself, but somebody's talking Sting at all. Oh, Sting, you're our hero. You're a legend. You're doing all this shit. They're trying to kill Sting. When you see Sting down, and it's taking him a while to get up, and he's surrounded by the referee, who's talking to whoever in the headset, Doc Sampson, who is making sure that... <laughs> who sounds like a fucking pulp hero from the 1930s. Doc Sampson is here! Doc Sampson... Whatever he asked Sting, he was looking at him so intently to figure out what was happening. He was probably saying, what the fuck's the matter with you? Flair's just wandering around, you know, wondering if his meal ticket's going to be okay here. But why did Sting do this? And if well, one, of, here, the, if one a, of these two things had gone just slightly more wrong, this would have been a disaster for AEW. And I know Darby's thing is the stunts. 
But this was a little bit too much. Maybe they just didn't realize was, how light he was. Was I don't Sting know. In, in his glory days known for stunts? Well, he was in uh, well the last battle in New Orleans, but they didn't really leave their feet in that one. Well, but and you that was know 87. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It, no, he's not a person that's known for stunts, right? He was a star and now he's an icon. But here from a Well, to be fair, for, you mean in ring stunts because he did do the cable yes. to the ring a lot. Well, that. I'm I'm talking right. about fucking diving through furniture off high precipices. Anyway, that's not the first thing you think of when you think of Sting beating the chest. Whoa, it's showtime and whatever the fuck. But speaking as someone who has not only operated promotions, but worked in the major ones of the time, he's the only guy there that's selling tickets right now. The, the, the house show, besides Wembley, I understand, I've heard rumors they're going back to Wembley. They're not really pumping it too hard, but I've heard rumors. But besides that, the atmosphere of the house show ticket sales across the board in the United States of America is miasmic. Google it, kids. M-I-A-S-M-I-C. You'll blow snot. And one shines through that putrid atmosphere. Greensboro. They've sold 15,000 tickets because it's Greensboro and it's Sting's last match. And they're trying to kill him two months away. He's a 65-year-old man. And sometimes just it, it, going through all of that shit that he's going through, you think, my God, I know he's in great cardio shape, but seriously. And then to have him do backwards bumps with a guy in his arms off a stage through tables onto floors for TV. By the time he retires, if he makes it to March, nobody's going to remember that bump. I, I don't know the ratings yet. I've been in secrecy. You're going to reveal them to me. But I can't believe that it, it was goddamn that many people that it was worth that. Not only for, for his health and welfare, but also Tony being an idiot. What's he going to do if Sting gets wheeled to the goddamn ring in the Greensboro Coliseum? Because he took this bump on TV. It's two months away. You know these people's track records. Jesus Christ. I just shouldn't sting and in a an amphitheater in Jacksonville. Not even a real goddamn arena. Yeah, that's the other thing. It's not like it's his big last time in Jacksonville, one of his favorite places in the world. And no, it's the place that they could get for whatever quaint reason they can't, but the point is, he should be having a triumphant last match in every one of these cities that he wrestles in with him and Darby against somebody to keep it succinct, let Darby sell, let Sting make the tag, let him make the comeback, and probably win by pinfall. You don't want to feed him the goddamn your entire roster. And, but then you could set something up for his last match, not what they're about to, to where, again, you would feature Sting, but you would hide his obvious weaknesses just because of age and gravity and not do things that will uh, rob Peter to pay Paul as far as you did this spectacular stunt and he's out for the rest of his fucking tour and career. Career! career so that's the way i've looked at this just from a business standpoint well that was the main event and again flair um oh god i thought rick was doing the orange cassidy thing when he chopped hobbs because i thought he was doing the the fucking light chop thing at first because People don't want to see the nature boy Ric Flair throw a chop unless he can fucking blister somebody just three shades shy of Wahoo, right? One time, pow, instead of boom, oh, that didn't work. Boom, oh, poke him in the eye. It, it just, <sighs> Nobody wants to feel bad watching Ric Flair. You want to remember as much as you can of him at his peak, and then you see him 
like this and it's just and i thought he was gonna fall down at one, or at least i thought he thought he was gonna fall down at one point because he was starting to you know waddle out of the ring or whatever was happening and he like kind of froze and didn't move for a second and i was like oh no if like there's a bump anywhere near him he's gonna go down but he somehow got out of the ring well but and <sighs> And there's the, the the two biggest stars involved in this are 65 and 70. What is Flair now? What have we established he is? 78? No, um, no, God damn it. He, no, he's born in 49. Huh. November. No, February. February of 49, right? Yes. <laughs> so, well, God, I'm arguing with myself. At least I have an intelligent person to bandy around back and forth with. Like the age of Ric he Flair. Was, he was born in February of 49. It's almost February of 24, so he's 74 and 7 eighths. And they're the yeah. biggest stars in this fucking operation here. If you're going to do anything with Ric Flair physical, save it for the pay-per-view in Charlotte. Or not Charlotte, Greensboro, excuse me. Yeah, yes. Yeah, don't, don't show them to where they get to Greensboro and they're like, oh, please, Rick, don't get physical. But anyway, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's that. But then, and of course, as I mentioned, my DVR, mercifully, they didn't want me to see the DVR gods that we pray to every week. Don't want me to see what's coming next because my DVR froze because it was 10 o'clock. So again, here's this big fucking angle. And I guess, I guess it's necessary to artificially inflate, as we have broken down mathematically, their overall number. But to have an overrun where, but of course, the I've seen the I've seen what I need to see. Tony Schiavone gets the ring and basically says, "Well, Sting, who's your final opponent going to be?" And wouldn't you know who won the pony? The Buckaroo. I thought they were, I thought that they were supposed to be from where was Buck Owens from out in California? Bakersfield. I thought the Buckaroos were supposed to be from Bakersfield, but they're from Cucamonga. And I encourage everybody to look up because it was covered on Twitter, the ludicrosity and the ridiculousness sisus of the way that they looked, but you got to see the pictures, you got to see the clip, whatever. They, they both, now their facial hair choice, Brian, what would, I saw people liking it to the 70s movie villain, but I, you know, it just, it, the, the, the Bond uh, fucking henchman, not even the boss, not, it's not like impressive or anything, it's just there. They're they're trying to show, I guess, maybe that in they France. have hair on their testicles. Maybe what? maybe if the James Bond film was in France, they could be the henchmen. Uh, French henchmen. They're either French. They're French henchmen. But what was more, they used to come out with tennis shoes and the fucking frilly things, and I don't know what the fuck they were wearing. But now they came out. One of them is wearing a black suit, and one of them is wearing an all white suit to where they looked like they had just come from a casting call of a goddamn amateur production of Spy vs. Spy from Mad Magazine. And they stand there, and from what I am led to believe by all the evidence I've been able to turn up, that's all that happened. They just stood there. Did you see anything else? No, they played their music. They stood there. The crowd wasn't exactly going crazy. There was a shot when they, when the music started playing, they had a wide shot and they started panning in and I'm watching everyone. There was one guy opposite the camera jumping for a second. No one else moved. No one moved. You ever think he got stung by a fucking hornet on his ass? Not only did a lot of people not want to see the young bucks come back right away, but to have them in this match I think for a lot of people that want to enjoy a last match for Sting, this may not be the opponent they would want to see in there. There is an argument that some people are making that the Young Bucks may be the perfect guys to get in there to have the best possible match with Sting. Are they going to do a tag match? Well, they haven't been worried about it so far when they put him in all these fucking 
scrambled egg cluster fucks about and that are is seen by more people than this are going to see this pay per view. So why should they? Is it, no, what? Hey, trust me, from a from an insider business standpoint, these two jolly jokers see fifteen thousand tickets sold in greensboro already and like what when hogan added himself to the fucking card against goldberg or whatever when they'd already sold forty thousand in the georgia dome they swooped back in they convinced tony well we'll take all these bumps and we'll fly for sting and we'll make him look like a million dollars so they get to be in the big match in front of fifteen thousand people with their new suits and their new stashes and because of Tony's stash and its never-ending bottom, he went for it. That's what they did. They're glory hogs. And they've swooped back. They might be able to have a great match. What about drawing money? What about well, selling tickets? They've known Sting was going to retire for all these months and months, and this is the best thing they've come up with. Well, let me read you a quote here. Uh... This was tweeted out by Wrestle Talk. This is from Dave Meltzer on his podcast. Oh, boy. There is no tag team in wrestling in the last how many years? Maybe even ever, but certainly in the last 20 years, there is no tag team in wrestling that is better at carrying people to good matches. Oh, good Lord. The things that they have done with Private oh, Party. The things that they have done to Private Party. With Dante and Darius Martin. Who <laughs> are... God damn it, I swear to God, if they if Dante and Darius Martin right here, as we sit here right now, we're on a street corner in the United States of America with a sign that says we'll wrestle for food, nobody would know who the fuck they were. When these guys were right out of the Indies, had never done a big match, and they made both of those teams look like they were the best tag team in wrestling. Oh, Christ. And teams that in five years were going to be through the roof. And What? And I'm not confident that either of those teams ever, or excuse me, are ever going to be at that level that they looked like. <laughs> Private Party still never had a match that good again. <laughs> the Martins, I don't know they've had a match that good. <laughs> so well, the what is fuck? <laughs> <laughs> They're going to be the top teams in five years, except they've never been that good again. And those matches were a while ago. So because of those matches, these guys are... You know the other argument. The, there are if they were if they if those matches were so great, then why are these guys now not in the main events, and why are they not selling tickets, and why are people not saying, "Oh, Dante, we love you" in massive numbers or whatever the fuck? They're not because they're not over. They they have a good match with a smaller and smaller subsection of the greater United States of America wrestling population says is great and they don't sell any tickets they don't draw any money because they're not over because they look like the interchangeable fucking children playing on their trampolines and that's why the other company is kicking their ass because there's grown men with hair on their chest and and balls and they're fighting each other in some respect instead of cooperative parkour and they can't, he can't get it. And so these children are going to come in and take a bunch of bumps for staying and fly around for staying and put staying over in however fashion. And the, the money at the live event has already been drawn before they ever even knew this. But they could have actually had a money pay-per-view match lined up instead of this last-minute bullshit from these glory hogs. Unless Sting said he wanted to have this match with the Young Bucks for his last match? Then somebody should have talked him out of it because he's still the employee. He's not the booker. He's not the promoter. He's not the owner of the company. He's not signing his check. Sting, you need to go out with a big money match, not a goddamn indie-rific fucking smart fan jack-off match. And I'm not trying to make this about the Bucks and FTR, but imagine if this was FTR versus Sting and Darby in Greensboro. They already sold the tickets. Jesus Christ. It's Sting's retirement match. There's the best match in the goddamn possible in the 
Available pool of pro wrestlers today staying in Darby Allen in Greensboro at FTR. And it would be a professional, responsible fucking way to send Sting off. Instead of these guys playing with their own fucking peckers again. Well, they showed up. They have their new look. They were going to reinvent themselves because they were dead in the water previously. And they have certainly not lit up anything in the last few hours, at least in terms of the fashion ne blogs. We'll find ne out. The neither one of them is Edison think. then if they were going to reinvent themselves. I don't know if I, if I was them, I'd quit my day job. I think the hardcore AEW fan, the AEW fan in the bubble, needs to acknowledge that more and more fans groan every time these two guys come out, no matter how long you keep them on, you know, off TV, on TV. No matter how long you keep them off TV. No, they, they groan both ways. They groan both ways, and the whole, how can I miss you if you ever go away, sometimes you're happy someone goes away. And it could stay that and, way for at least a while. That, yeah, <laughs> you feel that they didn't stay away nearly long enough sometimes. So I think the problem is for... The Sting retirement match, some of the negative feedback, again, some people are saying the Bucks may be the perfect opponents. For the other people, the whatever, 12,000 people that bought tickets, maybe it's more than that. I mean, to sell Oh, 15, 15. It's a sellout. I mean, it's going to be their yeah. biggest domestic show probably all year. Unless, I guess maybe Arthur Ashe. We'll see. Eh, good luck. But that crowd, you would have to think if you're buying tickets in advance for a show advertising Sting's retirement there's a chance that crowd may not be Young Bucks fans, or not even fans, but an audience that's as conducive to them as they would be Sting, traditional Sting. Yes, and why we just mentioned the perfect opponents, FTR, the best all-around pro wrestlers on the roster, still in their primes and able to do everything that you would need to do to get either Darby or Sting or both over instead of the flippy, floppy, goofy bullshit from these flaccid, flabby, skinny, fat, old, young buckaroos. <laughs> I've heard of skinny, fat, old, young is new. I have not heard that one before. They look like children, but they're almost eligible for AARP. That's going to be a new title for Tony. Uh, next year the old young bucks so i mean that we did it then that took us exactly 30 seconds to realize of everybody on that roster the people in greensboro north carolina would want to see these professional wrestlers engage with sting and darby allen not trampoline cowboys yeah well jim that was AEW dynamite and that was the return of the young bucks the elite back Running things in AEW, Hangman Page getting involved in the main event picture, and now the Young Bucks showing up uh, with their new hat and look. <clears throat> and of course, if you had to place a bet on what you thought was going to happen at AEW Revolution, Sting's retirement match, will it go over with that crowd? Will it not work with that crowd? Will it be an excellent match? Will it be the tribute everyone wants? If you wanted to place a bet, you may be able to go to the official. Uh, partner in one sense or another of ours. What are they exactly? What, I, mean, I don't know where you're... Will it go round in circles? Will it fly high like a bird up in the sky? Will it go round in circles? I'm talking about our friends at DraftKings, and they believe in us so much that their copy is bare this week, ladies and gentlemen. Well, you know, here's the thing. You know, they know that neither one of us are experts in the gambling philosophy because... You know, we, we, we're inexperienced, we're naifs, we're naive, we're babes in the woods. At the, the last time that I placed a bet and won that bet was in 1986 when I won $50 off of Ric Flair in the University of Louisville, North Carolina College basketball showdown. And then I quit while I was ahead. And, and you're not a, a big uh, sports bettor, even though you're a sports fan, but there are people we are, li we are broadcasting to right now that on a regular basis, they go out there and they win all kinds of money. They have new swimming pools put in with the money they win. They have new hookers come over to the house with the money they win. Whatever they do with their money, it's up to them, folks, and it's not for us to judge. Or maybe they just invest in their reasonable, nice people. And in they're in their, in their reasonably nice people who can invest in hookers and blow and things like that's, that. Because that's, they not want all this that's not an investment. Oh, 
That's well, an expenditure. It's, That's not an investment. An expen- but then you're going to get, in return, you're going to get something for it, a yeah. good time for it, at least a period of time. Chlamydia, Until gonorrhea, things head south. And, uh, yeah, and then the leprosy angle comes in. But anyway, a lot of the a lot of the listeners out there, they like to bet on the sports. They like to win the bets that they place, obviously. Sometimes you lose. These collector's plates can go down. However, if you go to DraftKings right now, the official sports betting partner of the NFL playoffs and a fine, fine sponsor of ours is what you were trying to say earlier. They're going to help make the playoffs electrifying. Bzz, because you'll be shocked. Boy, when you make these bets and you see what happened, you'll be fucking shocked. Because new customers right now, you bet $5 on any of these games and you get $200 instantly in bonus bets. So they're just going to give you $200 if you bet $5. So you, if you win, well, you're just, you're practically fucking robbing them at gunpoint, for heaven's sake. You're and practically got not time. robbing them. You're practically doing things the right way, the way they want you to do it. So, Well, you can win a lot more money by betting $205 than you can by betting just $5. And it's their money that they're going to be giving you if you win. So you're just stealing. You're just stealing from these people. You're not stealing. You're accepting... I don't even know if a gift is the right what, word. If, 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 are you accepting some kind of bribe or to not no. go over and rough them up if they don't pay off? What are you talking about here? There are no bribes involved in this. You're accepting a gratis, a, a wonderful gift for free, uh, and a, a, a you're doing well, it without really any robbery you being involved. Five dollars in it. You, you ain't gonna win this one. You can download the <laughs> DraftKings Sportsbook <laughs> app right now and use the code JCE. That's the way that you get the. $200 in bonus bets when you bet $5. And I don't know if that goes up in increments. For example, if you were to bet $50, would you get $2,000 in bonus bets? I don't know. Maybe the crown is yours, they say. Maybe the, this whole scam is geared toward you. Seems like that would be just like taking candy from it, a baby. It, but well, Let's make sure we understand that it is not a scam. This is not oh, a scam. I don't know why a, you would use that word. It's an arrangement, wink, wink. But right now, if you download the DraftKings Sportsbook, you just do whatever you do to download a DraftKings Sportsbook app or any other app for that matter. However you download an app, you do it. And then apparently some guy in a fucking pinstripe suit comes knocking on your door and delivers you the goddamn, the odds and everything. And then you place your bets with that gentleman. And you better pay up when he comes back if you lose. But if you no. win, he'll be bringing you cash no. In a in a, a a black briefcase handcuffed to his wrist. No cash. Well, I shouldn't say that, but no briefcase. There will be no gentleman coming to your door. It's a virtual online gentleman that you'll have no actual real-time interaction with. So he's virtually a gentleman, but not it. quite. It's not even he. It's an it. It's a well, no, hey, it. now, even though the line of work he's in is considered shady by some, there's no reason to dehumanize this poor That's guy. That's not what I'm doing. I'm saying... It overall is a virtual it that controls DraftKings. It's not necessarily a so, man so in a we're, top hat. We're trying to, to get door. people to do business with DraftKings and it's controlled by a virtual it. What is this? Some kind of artificial intelligence trying to take over the world? They're trying to get our information? <laughs> Virtual it is what happens when you don't send copy for your sports. Well, <laughs> download the DraftKings Sportsbook app if you know how to download an app, because I don't know how to do that, and use the code JCE. And if you know how to bet on sports, which I have no experience with either, then if you bet $5 and you're a new customer, you're going to get 200 bucks in bonus bets. And if you watch these people play the football – and you're reasonably certain you can figure this shit out, well, go ahead and do it. DraftKings Sportsbook app right now, code JCE, 200 bucks in bonus bets. It's, it's, it's the best I can do for you, not having a single fucking clue of how this whole shit works. That's right, and whether you have a clue or not, DraftKings is there for you. One more time, what's that promo code, Jim? JCE, the crown is yours. And also, it, it says, 
gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NEW-YORK or text HOPE-NEW-YORK-467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777. Boy, you hit the jackpot. Don't call, just play again. Or visit <laughs> ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. Oh. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas, we thank you. 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario, the giant black hole that is creeping ever wider. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. Is that even even in days? See dkng.com slash football for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gaming resources. <sighs> or just don't do any of that and just make your bet and see what happens. All right, DraftKings, the official betting partner of Jim Cornette. But Jim, with that, we are going to move on to uh, AEW Dynamite. <laughs> Remember when it had CC back in their copy? <laughs> Instead of C1, yeah. it said CC. <laughs> yeah, CC Rider. Just see what you have done. Oh, C. Well, CC Rider. On the topic of what have you done, Jim, let's talk about AEW Dynamite's ratings this past week, January 10th, 2024. They are. Okay, wh what have they done for us lately? Well, you know, I just want to um, mention something because I just recently saw it again for the first time in a little while. It's on my mind. One of my daughters was watching Freaks and Geeks, a show I loved when it was originally on, never in the same time slot, but I loved it. I've always had it around, always liked it. My kid's now watching it. The last episode, two of the kids, one who's kind of getting into punk, the other one who's kind of getting into comedy, they go to the local bowling alley where they're having disco night. And this is the, I think 1980, maybe, 81 it takes place. And at the back of the bowling alley, there's a little dance floor and there's a DJ playing some music and there's a few couples dressed like you would think dancing disco style and the two guys come and they yell disco sucks and the DJ says rock and roll sucks disco is alive it's alive <laughs> and one of the guys points out to him he says this place is empty we've been saying for a while that you can love a lot of these guys that you're putting on this show and they keep putting them on the show, but they're not getting new fans. They're not getting a lot of people into the buildings in a lot of cases. They're not getting their fans to stay around. Jim, AEW Dynamite's ratings this past week. TBS, 8 to 10.04 p.m. 797,000 viewers on average. Ouch! And I have a feeling there's going to be even more to this story from the glee that I hear in your voice. It's not glee in my voice, but it's just, you know, at what point do you acknowledge reality instead of doubling down over and over again on everything that's wrong? And I know there was strong competition. Trump was on one channel. The Republican <laughs> debate was on another channel. Oh, yeah. A lot, a lot of the AEW fans are going to be watching President Pig shit and the rest of his fucking criminal flock. But on the other hand, there was a new moon about the happened so there wasn't really anything to see in the sky so a lot of people were inside not watching the stars jim 8 to 8 15 p.m quarter one these were compiled by wrestlenomics claudio castagnoli versus adam page with picture in picture one million one thousand viewers Okay, so they open again over a million and now i see from their average that uh things are about to get bumpy well, and once again, I paid attention this week. The first minute of the show, not just on my DVR, but at actual 8 o'clock, when every other network at 8 o'clock went to their other shows, right? I still had one more minute of Big Bang Theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Quarter 2, 8.15 to 8.30 p.m. Claudio Castagnoli versus Adam Page continued. An ad break. And the start of Adam Copeland, Dustin Rhodes, Orange Cassidy, <laughs> And Preston Vance versus Lance Archer and the Mogul Embassy, 895,000 viewers. I had to quote the late, great Percy Pringle, oh, sweet Jesus. 
And again, coming off quarter one, which was a minute of the Big Bang Theory, you have to think the starting crowd may have been somewhere in the 900s for AEW, just to see what it was going to be. Yeah, one would think. Quarter three, 8.30 to 8.45 p.m., the continuation of that eight-man tag, I'm not listing all them again, with picture-in-picture picture and an ad break, 795,000 viewers. <sighs> another 100,000 people in another 15 minutes. So now they are 206,000 from down from the top of the hour, the last minute of the Big Bang Theory, they've lost 206,000 people. I don't know if any of this data is out there, so I'm just going to throw it out there in case one of the listeners hears this and can get back to us. In terms of the type of matches, singles match, tag match, six-man tag, eight-man tag, men or women, is there a study that shows in the last few years which match drove off more viewers <laughs> off these shows? It's got to be the multiple eight-mans, battle royals. That has to be the I would think, too. Uh, that's why I want to see if there's any actual data there, because you would think so, too. But well, let's go back to this quarter, 4, 8.45 to 9 p.m. The Bullet Club Gold and Acclaimed and Billy Gunn backstage angle. Samoa Joe's confrontation and promo, or conf promo and confrontation, I should say, with Swerve Strickland and Adam Page. The angle with Hook and Samoa Joe. And Tony Storm's timeless backstage promo. 915,000 viewers. Wait, what? Also, the high point. In the key demo, it jumped from 380 to 465. Now, how have they ever done a quarter hour where they gained 120,000 viewers? Samoa Joe. Confrontation with Swerve Strickland. I don't think it was the acclaimed and Bullet Club Gold thing, and I don't think it was Tony Storm's brief promo. It was Samoa Joe. People are more intrigued by what Samoa Joe is going to do coming out of that main event than Adam Cole. I'll put it that way. So are these people just clicking back and forth every once in a while, hiding and watching to see when somebody actually shows up they want to see? Now, again, there was competition. I think it is important to note this week. But the big 9 o'clock hour, Jim, quarter 5, 9 to 9, 15 p.m., Ricky Starks versus Sammy Guevara with picture-in-picture and the post-match with Big Bill, Chris Jericho, and his music, and an ad break, 774,000 viewers. Jesus Christ! So they, they lost uh, 26, 34, 141,000 after quarter four was over with at the top of the hour. They said, well, okay, fuck it. So now they're at their low point, right after the, really the high point. But wait, there's more. Okay. Quarter 6, 9.15 to 9.30 p.m. Anna J, Chris Statlander, Thunder Rosa, and Willow Nightingale versus Julia Hart, The Outcasts, and Sky Blue, with picture in picture, 689,000 viewers. Oh, no. All right, there went another... 85,000 people, so now we're, from the second quarter, which is a more legitimate number, we're down 206,000 people, and from the point that they started at the top of the hour with the last minute of the Big Bang, we're down 312,000. Well, Jim, we go to quarter 7, 9.30 to 9.45 p.m. Wheeler Yuta's video, Roderick Strong versus Brian Keith, and the Adam Cole and Undisputed Kingdom Live promo, Deanna Perrazzo confrontation with Red Velvet, and an ad break. Oh, that's break, what that was. And an ad break, 702,000 viewers. Good Lord, that's kind of insulting that a quarter filled with jobbers actually picked up 13,000 people. Well, we go now to quarter eight, and I remind you, we have a four-minute overrun. Quarter eight, nine, 45 to 10 p.m., Darby Allen and Sting versus Kanosuke Takeshita and Powerhouse Hobbs with picture in picture. 636,000 viewers. Oh. With a four minute overrun, including the return of the Young Bucks to challenge, without words, Sting and Darby <laughs> Allen, 688,000 viewers. Could have with menacing glances. So they finished up at 636, which is 300. 
65,000 people below where they started, and then the four-minute overrun was basically a bunch of people stared at each other, and that was whatever they were tuning in for the the following program. So, good Lord, it, did we do an average for the uh, actual numbers, quarters two through eight? Oh, uh, no, hold on. Let's, uh, let me get the old calculator out here. So we are going to start with quarter two, 895. You don't have to be so aggressive on those numbers. Oh, uh, no, I hit the wrong number. You, dis you distracted me. I hit the wrong number. Oh, Hold it's on. my fault. Okay. Sing or something while I'm doing this. No one wants to hear this sound. Well, you don't know what you got till it's gone. They paved paradise and put up a parking lot. Tony Khan's about 15 minutes away from becoming a parking attendant if things keep going this way. The average without the first quarter and without the overrun was 772,000 viewers. Ouch. So they, they picked up... Well, really, they only picked up 25,000 in their overall average by fudging the numbers. So they go, they go through all that trouble just to get an extra 20,000 people. Once again, no star power. I mean, no real star power. No Moxley for AEW. No MJF. Jericho wasn't announced, and he showed up, and that may be a falling star or shooting star at this point. I'm not sure. But yet, we were Yuta uh, in a video. I'm looking at the lineup here. Sting and, Darby, Sting and Darby in the main event did nothing. They've done nothing to build up to Kesha and Hobbs that wouldn't just appeal to AEW's hardcore fans. Doesn't make sense to anyone else. And they were plugging that match with Sting and Darby, and they still wouldn't hang around for it through the rest of that brutal program. You know, again, I've said this in the past, and I'll say it again, and I thought about it again this week. Don't diminish the problem that is the commentary and how the, the same way Michael Cole, in a lot of ways, was detrimental to everyone. His style, the way he was being produced, and the way he decided right. to do things was detrimental to everyone except Vince and Kevin Dunn. Excalibur and Shivani and Taz gets dragged right into it. It's not an effective group. They aren't commentators you could stand unless you're like, you know, again, really deep inside with AEW and loving it. Well, that, that's it's a, a thing struggle. With with goofball sock face, he's like one of these really dedicated tape trading marks of the '90s doing commentary on you know, outrageous indie matches in his basement. Because imagine this, that's the way he started. And, he, and you, people are not going to listen to that shit. And, and he's not a good broadcaster, and he's not, he can't tell a fucking dramatic story without using 15 Japanese move names. He's not a communicator to a mass amount of people. And Tony is just, Yelling how great and funny everything is. He's not he's not doing anything because what's he gonna fucking do? And with this shit in front of him. And you know, he's 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 certainly not gonna suddenly turn into Jim Ross or or Bill Watts or Lance Russell or Gordon Soley or whatever the fuck. And you can't analyze as a as a legitimate sports announcer, you can't analyze most of this shit anyway. Bad commentators make it tough to care. That's my point. When you have bad commentators, it makes it tough to care about the show. It makes it tough to listen to the show and want to hear what's going on and want to hear explanations. When shit's going down and these three are just laughing about who... They're, like, they're popping each other like during like hardcore matches and shit. Yeah, or, you know, on a crazy bump, they're, they're laughing like, oh, shit, oh, look at that. There's so many problems there. And again, you blame the two guys in the corner yelling, Disco sucks. You say it's alive. It's empty. It's empty. They'll get a bump next week because there won't be a Republican debate and you'll maybe get Moxley or someone back. But they're not picking anyone up. They're losing people. And this isn't the first time they've had big competition. They're not holding up at all. Now, if there's any competition, they're losing more people. And yeah, the cable universe is shrinking. And think about this. How fucking miserable was this program when people would actually think, I'll switch this off and go watch fucking Trump or a bunch of fucking Republicans talk? 
Do you think Tony would have thought that because of those programs being on, which would, you would think, zap a portion of at least your over 50 audience for wrestling, if you know you have competition like that, is that the reason why you have, I mean, again, two eight-person or eight person <laughs> tags, Claudio versus Adam Page, which doesn't mean anything right now. No, I think he th he still thinks this shit's good. Starks versus Guevara was... at the 9 o'clock hour? He thought that was I... okay? I I think Tony's doing the best he can, and I don't think that, uh, you know, he was thinking about having competition, and once again, the over 50 audience, anybody over 50 watching this television program that's ever been a wrestling fan and not not getting paid to watch it or making money somehow watching it ought to be ashamed of themselves. This should be for fucking juvenile delinquents and people with some type of personality disorders under the age of 25 or 28. And that main event with Sting is going to be interesting because I've seen feedback already from people who they want to support the event because of what they remember Sting as being years ago, even Surfer Sting. Putting the Young Bucks in that match did nothing to make that audience happy. It's the exact opposite. It's, you know, someone getting stuffed into a situation you don't want them in. Sort of like when the buckaroos were growing up getting stuffed in lockers, and now they're lashing out because they've got a billionaire at their beck and call. Well, you see, if they had someone responsible around them back then, they could have said, call Stephen P. New, he could sue for you. Well, but no, Stephen P. New would have never taken their case, because if anybody ever did something to deserve being stuffed in a locker, I'm sure it was Matt and Nick Buckaroo. But I'll tell you who can call Stephen P. New at newlawoffice.com 87750-STEVE, and that is anybody with a legitimate case against a an evildoer or a, a big corporation, an evil, negligent entity that is harmed or depressed or downtrod the little man or the little woman or even the little babies. That's who Stephen P. New takes up for, and that's who should call him at 877-50-STEVE, or just log on to the website and check the man out. He's, he's saved more souls than the Pope, and he'll pull your fat out of the fire, even if you're skinny. He'll fatten you up, set you on fire, and then pull you out of it. Stephen what? P. New is our, and who's... What? Coming soon to California, by the way. More on that in the upcoming weeks when we're allowed to speak. And for heaven's sake, can you can you think of any more famous attorney now that in the history of pro wrestling, he's outpaced Clarence Mason. Everybody in the wrestling business knows Stephen P. New. If he can be the voice of the voice of the voiceless, then he can speak for you. And he's not afraid of the big bad wolf like Chris Jericho. No, he's not even afraid of Lisa Wolf. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. He may be afraid of Lisa Wolf, from what I heard. Well, but... she's got to be elderly by this point. I mean, my God, she'd have to be 80, wouldn't she? Once again, that's uh, Stephen P. New. At 877-50-STEVE. Well, Jim, with that, I think we've done enough for today, and we have the experience right around the corner, and we have these ratings to really think about, and... Well, you say the experience right around the corner like we're hiding in wait in the shadows, ready to hit somebody over the head with a tire iron, take their last dime, pick their pockets. That's, not the, that's not the way that people consume the experience and then feel about it afterwards. They don't feel like they've been hit over the head and had their pockets picked. They feel, they feel relieved and refreshed, and, and they have a, a more positive outlook on life, sort of like a... Somebody lurking around the corner in the shadows to give you a hand job. So we're gonna no, not really, we're gonna give no. everybody a hand job on the experience this week. No, we are not going to be doing that, mate. You could do whatever you want. It's a I've free only country. got two hands, and I'm not even ambidextrous. You got to help me out a little bit. I'll be over here, uh, not watching, not uh, not acknowledging. I'll be over here away from all that. Whatever goes on in your little hand job kingdom, I'm not gonna be involved in this. Well, the four sisters on Thumb Street will help me out. They'll pull me through. Well, you know, we were trying to end this show, and then you got all perverted and kind of... Well, it's your show. Track. You can you wrap it Fucking up Bob Guccione over here all of a sudden starts like, let's talk about 
penis or whatever the fuck's happening. Listen, what, what are you talking? I didn't say the word. Pe- You're the one that said the word penis. Well, whether penis or Peter, uh, whatever your name may be, you can or listen to the Jim Cornette Peter, experience. Peter, 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 Peter Cedar. Uh, I think I was one of the people on Bitch Slap, if I remember correctly. But you can listen to the Jim Cornette Experience wherever you find your favorite podcast. And, of course, the drive through next week, the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel, The Archive, patreon.com slash Cornette. Follow us on Twitter, social media, Arcadian Vanguard, The Wrestling News. We've done enough. We'll talk to you on The Experience. Tally-ho! Handjob. <laughs>